Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Good evening and welcome to you all. Thank you for coming tonight and firstly apologies for the late start of tonight. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to kick off with a small introduction to what's happening tonight and uh, a short introduction to our, um, our, our respected speakers for tonight. Um, firstly, uh, just to say this uh, event's been brought to you by uh, the Muslim Information Service Scotland and the Young Muslims Glasgow, um, as well as a number of different sponsors. Uh, so thanks to Halal Mortgages, JBNS, Mango PR and Islamic Finance Council Scotland. Tonight's format, um, I'll tell you what the format is first of all to explain to you exactly uh, what we're trying to achieve for tonight's session. Uh, there will be main presentations done by uh, both of the speakers. Um, 40 minutes each. Uh, so first of all will be Mr. Shabir Ali, uh, for, followed by Dr. Sharosh for 40 minutes. Then there will be a rebuttal uh, on the behalf of either speaker for 18 minutes. Then a further rebuttal of 9 minutes. And a last small rebuttal of 4 minutes each as a conclusion. Uh, there will be a break, of, break for prayers uh, around uh, 9.35 uh, in, later on in the evening. And a uh, collection of question and answers. And I'll explain exactly how we're going to do the question and answers. Uh, that will be around 15, 10 to 15 minutes, depending on what time we have left. Uh, and we're hoping to conclude tonight uh, just after uh, 10.20. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce tonight's speakers. We are very uh, blessed to have uh, two uh, very experienced speakers, uh, Mr. Shabir Ali and Dr. Shirosh. As a quick introduction uh, to Shabir Ali, um, he hails from the other side of the Atlantic, where he lives with his wife and four children. Uh, he is the president of the Islamic Information and Dawah Center International, based in Toronto, Canada. Um, he has a BA in Religious Studies from uh, Laurentian, uh, Laurentian University in Canada. And he is currently completing his master's degree with the Department for the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto. Mr. Ali has served for many years as an Imam and public speaker for Islam. He appears as a regular guest on a weekly television broadcast in Canada called Let the Quran Speak. And he's represented Islam in many interfaith dialogues and debates. In fact, in this very hall, he's fruitfully, uh, had fruitful dialogues with Dr. Joel Marcus and others. And elsewhere, he's debated with Dr. John Warwick, M Warwick Montgomery and, his, and the scholar of international repute, Dr. William Lane Craig. Mr. Ali considers himself a student of the experienced masters who have trodden the path of interfaith dialogue and debate, such as Sheikh Ahmed Didat and Dr. Jamal Badawi. Dr. Anis Shirosh, um, at the Albert Hall in London, December 1985, at the great debate, Is Jesus God? Dr. Shirosh was introduced to the UK audience. He and Mr. Didat had another great debate at the National Exhibition Centre, Birmingham, in August 1988. And the tremendous attendance was nearly 12,000, where the topic was the Quran or the Bible, which is God's word. Dr. Shirosh refers to Muslims as our beloved Muslim friends, and even his website has the word Islam spelled ar 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 acrostically. It denounces, I sincerely love all Muslims, and furthermore, he tries to follow the Bible's instructions, which simply states to tell the truth in love. Dr. Shirosh and his wife have been in the Christian International Ministry for 40 years, and they are parents of four biological children and numeral, numerous spiritual ones. They enjoy the fun and fellowship with their eight grandchildren. Let us welcome uh, to the stage uh, Dr. Shirosh and uh, Mr. Shabir Ali to the great city of Glasgow, Scotland. I'd like to mention a few guidelines for tonight's uh, dialogue. Um, firstly, that uh, if we could, uh, we'd like to carry out this dialogue in, in the true spirit of dialogue and not of debate and not of trying to win one over another person, but in true time to understand each other's religion if we can leave tonight having understood each other's religions in some small way, then it will be a successful evening. And for that purpose, we ask and we tell the audience that there will be no cheering or outcries or shouting of any kind, no matter how spiritually desperate you feel to, to, to cry out. 
even if no one likes what the speaker has to say, and you may hear some blunt comments tonight about either religion, but in the true spirit of dialogue, it's important for us to listen to those statements and take that in. Whether we agree with it or not, that is up to ourselves. The speakers will handle that in their rebuttal times. Um, so I ask the audience tonight to be disciplined and maintain good behavior and they show respect towards the speakers. Um, and if you do not show that respect, uh, there are a number of heavy uh, young men out there, uh, I mean heavy as in muscly, um, who have uh, bright orange bar badges with uh, uh, biometric scanning on them so you can tell exactly who they are. And uh, they will have absolutely no qualms in escorting you or otherwise outside of the hall. Um, all mobiles, please, if you could switch them off or at least keep them on silent and please don't try and answer the, in the middle of the hall saying, hello! Uh, a very important announcement which is about photographs. Now there has been a specific request by the speakers in fact that uh, if you wish to take hands up who's got a digital camera or uh, just a stills camera. Nobody agree, that's like one, one little one, okay. Uh, for that individual <laughs> uh, and anyone else who has a camera in the audience, please um, if you wish to take photographs, please do so within the first five minutes of the main introduction of either speaker, after which we could um, ask you politely, please do not take any photographs so as not to disturb the speakers in their flow of speech. Uh, there will be no videoing of the event, either from any uh, uh, dodgy underhand cameras anywhere there, um, and uh, as there will be professional copies available to everyone after the event. Um, if anyone... Uh, Papers and pens will be handed out uh, to, uh, near the question and answer session during the rebuttal stage. Uh, and uh, as I said, in terms of the questions and answers, we'll only take questions uh, by written questions only. We won't take any uh, questions from the platform tonight. No, no one can stand up and ask any questions. So if you wish to uh, ask uh, any questions, please think about, the, about them while the main speeches are going on and write them down on the piece of paper where they'll be handed to one of the, hand them to one of the stewards at the end of the rows uh, and then they'll collect them at the end and we'll uh, try and ask those questions at the end. In terms of a bit of health and safety, of course, um, fire exits um, at the right of the podium um, and the front of the entrance in case of any eventuality. Uh, the gents' toilets are behind the stage and the ladies' toilets, I believe, are upstairs and the front for you, uh, are not, they're all signposted. Uh, there's limited facilities for those who wish to do ablution, for example. Um, please maybe try and quietly uh, leave a little bit earlier as we're running a uh, very tight schedule already and, we, uh, and there won't be much time before we have to start the prayer. And in case of any particular emergency, please do follow the instructions of the stewards um, uh, who will direct you uh, out, out, out of the building. Um, I'm going to call uh, the first speaker for tonight. Uh, it's... Uh, Mr. Shabir Ali, um, and he will, I will ask him to adhere strictly to the format, and he, I'll ask him to come to the stage uh, where he will speak for 40 minutes. Thank you all very much. I'm delighted to be with you uh, speaking in this hall one more time. I begin by praising God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and asking to send peace and blessings upon all of you and upon all of his prophets and messengers throughout time. In the spirit of dialogue and friendship, uh, I'd like to uh, first begin by saying that uh, I was uh, at the bookshop a couple of days ago and I saw a book that uh, I have benefited from reading, and I felt that uh, my friend Dr. Anish Shirosh may also appreciate a book like this. I'd like to offer him this gift. Now, folks, to begin with, I'd like to offer uh, five arguments to show that the Bible, both in the Old and New Testaments, speak of Muhammad. First, I'd like to say that uh, Muhammad is the prophet, uh, like Moses, spoken of in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, William Montgomery Watt writes in his book, Muslim Christian Encounters, on page 36, the passage in Deuteronomy, in chapter 18, verses 14 to 19, in which Moses says to the Israelites that God will raise up for them from among their brothers a prophet like himself, seemed to state a general principle, namely, that when God's people need divine guidance or other help, God will send a prophet to give them that. This principle could be taken to be fulfilled in a whole series of prophets who, 
through many centuries guided the Israelites. The later Jews thought it applied to the coming of the Messiah, and it, is, it was taken in this sense by the early Christians and applied to Jesus in Acts chapter 3, verse 22 and forward. From this standpoint, a Christian can admit that in a sense, it also applies to Muhammad. Now, was the prophet Muhammad like the prophet Moses? The Collins Gem Dictionary of the Bible by Reverend James Dow states on pages 402 to 403, as a statesman and lawgiver, Moses is the creator of the Jewish people. He found a loose conglomeration of Semitic people, none of whom had been anything but a slave, and whose ideas of religion were a complete confusion. He led them out and he hammered them into a nation with a law and a national pride, and a compelling sense of being chosen by a particular God who was supreme. The only man in history who can be compared even remotely to him is Mahomet. I've tried to pronounce it the way he spelt it. So ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that according to these uh, Christian uh, scholars, it is easy to see that Muhammad was the prophet like Moses that is spoken about in that passage in Deuteronomy, even if previously uh, that passage was understood in some way as referring to Christ. Now, was Muhammad from among the brethren of the Israelites? I would say yes. Now, Abraham begat Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael begat the Arabs, and Isaac begat the Israelites. Now, let's look at a parallel case to see if the Israelites and Ishmaelites are brothers. Harper's Bible Dictionary explains on page 246 that Isaac begat Esau and Jacob Israel. Esau begot the Edomites, and Jacob Israel begot the Israelites. So here you have the Edomites from Esau and the Israelites from Jacob Israel. Now, are these two brothers of each other? Yes. The Bible calls them the brothers of the Israelites. That is, the Edomites are the brothers of the Israelites, according to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 8. Moreover, the Bible tells the Israelites, do not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. That is Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 7. I put before you then, ladies and gentlemen, that this establishes the general principle that in the language of the Bible, the descendants of two brothers are the brothers of each other. Therefore, the descendants of Ishmael are the brothers of the descendants of Isaac. Hence, Muhammad being an Ishmaelite qualifies on this count. Dr. Shurosh, in fact, admits that Muhammad is from Ishmael. On page 73 of his book, Islam Revealed, he gives a family tree tracing Muhammad to, the, to his ancestor, Feher, known as Quraysh. And he adds, Feher is directly descended from Ishmael in the male line. My second point is that Muhammad fulfills the promise that God made in the Bible to Abraham and his son Ishmael. Specifically, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 20, we read of God's promise to make Ishmael a great nation. Now, in the Kamash, a Jewish Bible commentary edited by, edited by Rabbi Nossan uh, Sherman and Rabbi Mir Zlotowitz, on page 78, we find the following commentary on this verse. I quote, We see from the prophecy in this verse that 2,337 years elapsed before the Arabs, Ishmael's descendants, became a great nation with the rise of Islam in 624 CE. Now, Dr. Shirosh wrote that the promises God made to the Arabs through Ishmael were fulfilled precisely. He wrote, and I quote, I will make him a great nation was fulfilled when the Muslim empire was a reality from the 7th to the 12th centuries. That's in his book, Islam Revealed, page 208. The implication of that is that since the rise of the Muslim empire was precipitated by the prophethood of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his very prophethood then is the fulfillment of that promise that God had made to Abraham and his son Ishmael. My third point is that Muhammad is that person who is being described in the Song of Solomon, and especially in, verse, uh, in chapter 5, verse number 16, where it says he is altogether lovely. Now, on the surface, this is uh, a love poem depicting sexual love between a man and a woman. But Jewish commentators 
and the classical commentary known as Song of Songs Rabbe have interpreted this poem as uh, meaning or depicting the love between God and his people. In the Bible of Judaism library series, Jacob Neusner, in fact, uh, contributes a volume entitled Israel's Love Affair with God, Song of Songs. And the title of that book tells you what it deals with. Now, Christian commentators came along and they said that it is a depiction of the love between Christ and his church, his people, his followers. In the church's Bible series, Richard A. Norris Jr. contributes his volume entitled The Song of Songs Interpreted by Early Christian and Medieval Commentators. These commentators agree that the love is between Christ and his church. Recently, Roger Ellsworth, uh, president of the Illinois State Baptist Association, published his book entitled He is Altogether Lovely, Discovering Christ in the Song of Solomon. Again, the title of the book is quite telling. Now, is it possible for Muslim commentators to see here a description of the love between Muhammad and his ummah, his people, his followers? I would say yes. It turns out that Roger Ellsworth entitled his book with the words from a key passage in the Song of Songs. In chapter 5, verse 8, the female charges that if the daughters of Jerusalem should find her beloved, they should declare her love for him. In verse 9, they ask what is so special about her beloved, or how does he st stand out from the others? In reply, as she describes his virtues in the next six verses. Then she caps the description in verse 16 with these words. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. Song of Som Solomon, or Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 16 in the New International Version Bible. Both Jewish, and Muslim, uh, both Jewish and Christian commentators agree that his mouth is sweetness itself is a reference to the nature of his words. Hence, Jewish commentators have said that since this refers to God, the sweetness of his mouth means the words of the Torah. Is it possible for Muslims to say that this sweetness refers to the words of the Quran? I think so. It turns out that the words in Hebrew, which is translated, he is altogether lovely, contains an echo of Muhammad's name. Translating the sentence as he is totally desirable, Temper Longman III writes in the New International Commentary on the Old Testament on page, 11, uh, page 175, and I quote, between quotes I will not add any words of my own. If you hear a Hebrew word sound, that is because it's there in his text. Quote, again she concludes with a general comment this time with a statement of her intense desire for him. The word desirable, Muhammadim, derives from the root hamd. All the derivatives of hamd refer to outward appearance. They also emphasize more the attractiveness of an object with some emphasis on the value of the object. Now what you heard there, ladies and gentlemen, is the name Muhammadim, which uh, in Hebrew contains the plural suffix im, and if that is dropped, which is a plural suffix here out of respect, then we see that we have there an echo of the name Muhammad, exactly. And though in Hebrew it obviously means something slightly different than it means in Arabic, we reflect that the Hebrew word system is based on the same triliteral root system that the Arabic root is based on. And hence why the name Muhammad is based on the triliteral root HMD, which might be pronounced hamd, which means praise. In a similar way, in the Hebrew here, it is based on H-M-D. Longman continues, the wasf, or the description, ends with a definite proclamation to the women, the daughters of Jerusalem, to whom she has been speaking. They asked in chapter 5, verse 9, for a description of her lover, and she has given it to them. Ladies and gentlemen, I put before you that this song then can be interpreted as meaning that this lover of Muhammad, meaning the, the ummah or the people of Muhammad, are calling on the people of Jerusalem to recognize Muhammad and to believe in him, to consider him desirable, to want to have him. And in that case then, my third point holds that uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is he that is described in the Song of Solomon. My fourth point, turning now to the New Testament documents, we see that there is an expectation of uh, another prophet 
that prophet who was to be like Moses that we heard about at the beginning of my speech from the book of Deuteronomy. But now we're reading the New Testament in the Gospel according to John in chapter 1 verse 19. The Jews asked John the Baptist who he was and they offered three possibilities. They suggested, are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Not just simply a prophet, but are you the prophet? Now he denied that he was any of these. And we know who the Christ was, but who was the prophet? Raymond Brown, in his uh, two-volume commentary on the Gospel according to John, uh, tells us that it was the prophet like Moses who we already heard about in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 to 18. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce uh, Dr. Raymond Brown. He is one of the most, uh, uh, he is the foremost, in fact, New Testament scholar uh, in our uh, present time. He passed away a few years ago, and he has left uh, his mark on New Testament scholarship. His two-volume commentary on the Gospel according to John is the most massive I have encountered and uh, most uh, detailed. In fact, uh, a couple of years ago, when I debated my friend Joseph Smith in Leicester, he recommended that I uh, read Raymond Brown, and I took that recommendation seriously. Now, this expected prophet would be a temporal ruler, we can tell, and therefore he was not Jesus, because Jesus was not a temporal ruler. According to John chapter 6, verse 14 in the NIV, after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. In verse number 15, the very next verse, it says that Jesus, knowing that they, uh, what they intended, uh, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again into the hills by himself. Now, why would they intend to make Jesus king after recognizing him as the prophet? Obviously because they expected that he is to be the prophet like Moses who would be a king. And Jesus was not to be that king, therefore he was not to be the prophet like Moses. Raymond Brown writes, the Qumran, Qumran Essenes, or Essenes seem to have expected three eschatological figures, a prophet, a priestly messiah, and a royal messiah. This is on page 46 of his uh, uh, two-volume commentary, volume two, uh, volume one, rather. And further, we find in 1 Maccabees, uh, chapter 4, verses 41 to 50, and uh, other references, the expectation of the coming of a prophet who could solve legal problems on the pattern of Moses. At Qumran, the Essenes are told to cling to the Torah and the ancient laws of the community until a prophet comes, presumably the prophet like Moses. This is on his page 49. Now, this expected prophet would not come from Galilee, we learn also in the Gospel according to John. And since Jesus came from Galilee, Jesus is not that expected prophet. John chapter 7 verses 40 to 41 reads, uh, that some of the crowd who heard these words began to say, this is undoubtedly the prophet. They're thinking of Jesus. Others were claiming this is the Messiah, so opinion is divided. And an argument ensues. Is he the prophet? Is he the Messiah? Could he fulfill the qualifications of each? The objection was raised that the Messiah had to be born in Bethlehem. And everyone knew that he was from Galilee. So how could that be? Now, a Christian would obviously answer by saying, look at Matthew and Luke's Gospels. Jesus was born at Bethlehem, so he fulfills the requirement to be the Messiah. But what about being that prophet? John chapter 7, verse 52 says, look it up and you won't find the prophet arising in Galilee. The essential point here, then, is that the prophet will not come from Galilee. And since Jesus does come from Galilee, he obviously does not qualify. So in the case of the Messiah, the essential point was that regardless where his hometown is, he should be born in Bethlehem. The essential point about the prophet is that regardless where he's born, he must not be from Galilee. And so I put before you, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, Jesus did not fulfill that prophecy. Now, Acts of the Apostles in chapter 3, verses 22 and forward, has Peter saying that Jesus must remain in heaven until that time of restoration occurs, when God will give you that prophet that he promised. Now, does he mean that Jesus in his second coming will fulfill the requirements of being the prophet like Moses? That's a possibility. 
But even if that is a possibility, it means then that Jesus in his first coming did not fulfill the requirement of being the prophet like Moses. What seems more obvious from the reading of Acts chapter 3 from Peter's words, Jesus must remain in heaven until that time of restoration comes when God actually sends that prophet like Moses and then eventually Jesus will make his second coming. So altogether I conclude from my fourth point that uh, Jesus was not the fulfillment of that prophet like Moses and even if he was seen as a partial fulfillment for the time, it must be held now that Muhammad more so fulfills uh, that uh, prediction than Jesus did. Now my fifth and last point is that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the paraclete that is spoken about in the Gospel according to John in chapters 15 and 16. If these two chapters are read as an earlier form of Jesus' saying than chapter 14. Now I've said a mouthful there and I'd like to break that apart and tell you what it means. But first, what is this term paraclete? How many words are there in the Bible which require such uh, a retention of the original Greek term? Parakletos in Greek now is given an anglicized version, paraclete. Even the word Christ is easily translated as, a, as a anointed, and no one will complain that the meaning is incorrect or incomplete. Anointed in English means Christ. But what about the word paraclete? Various uh, translations have been proposed. Comforter, counselor, advocate. But none of these translations prove adequate to biblical scholars. And many prefer to just retain the term paraclete. In fact, if you look at the biblical commentaries on the Gospel according to John, you will often find that a separate treatment is given just to this term. Usually the narrative goes verse by verse and suddenly the narrative breaks off to give you some sort of an appendix, an insertion of a long article just explaining what the paraclete is. It obviously has proved a puzzling term. Why is this so? I think we'll find the answer to this tonight. First, what does the term paraclete mean and can it mean uh, a prophet? When we put two and two together, here is what we find. According to Harper's Bible Dictionary, 1985 edition, on page 749, uh, the word means one called to the side of. One called to the side of. Now, you know the term uh, having a call or receiving a call. Someone says, I received a call to the ministry. Means that somehow God called him, summoned him to the job. He received the calling. So the paraclete is one called to the side of. Now the same dictionary tells us that the Hebrew word for prophet, nabi, means one who calls or one who is called. That's on page 826. This seems to mean that paraclete is nabi. A paraclete is a prophet. Now, this meaning, in fact, uh, is supported by a number of other points. The Old Testament scholar Bernard Anderson, in his book, Understanding the Old Testament, says that it is uncertain whether the word Nabi means one who calls or one who is called. In other words, is it active, one who is calling, or is it passive, one who is called to service? He adds that the word means a prophet. He explains that prophet is an intermediary, a spokesperson, one who acts and speaks on behalf of another. That's in his fourth edition, page 248. So now, a prophet is an intermediary, a spokesperson. Now, if you reflect uh, on the story of Moses, you can understand the meaning of this word prophet. If you've seen the Ten Commandments, well then, there is Charlton Heston starring as Moses. And Moses gets this command from God. He's to go preach the message to the Pharaoh. But Moses complain about, complains about his own speech impediment and he asks uh, for an assistant, someone to speak for him. So God says to him in Exodus chapter 7 verse 1, see, I'm appointing you as God to the Pharaoh and Moses as your prophet. In other words, just as God would have spoken to Pharaoh, Moses goes instead. He plays God. And just as Moses should have been the prophet for God, speaking on God's behalf, now Aaron speaks on behalf of Moses. So Aaron is the prophet of Moses, one who speaks 
for another is called a prophet. And a prophet of God is one who speaks on behalf of God. In other words, a spokesperson for God. Now, among the meanings assigned by Raymond Brown to the term paraclete are an intercessor, a mediator, a spokesperson. That's in his volume 2, page 1136. Ladies and gentlemen, I conclude from this that uh, a paraclete and a nabi, a prophet, means almost the same thing. And sensing this meaning, Stephen Byington, in his uh, translation of the Bible, the Bible in Living English, translates the term paraclete as spokesman. And so whereas you might be familiar with some Bible translations that say that uh, God will send the, the comforter, here you have it in Stephen Byington's translation that God will send another spokesman. And from that we know that this obviously refers to another prophet. Now, I did say that I will read the Gospel according to John, chapters 15 and 16, as being distinct from chapter 14. Let me explain. Today it is widely accepted in biblical scholarship that the Gospel according to John was composed towards the close of the first century AD, roughly around the year 100. This would mean about 70 years after Jesus had left the scene. And in the meantime, the Gospel according to John went through several stages uh, of, uh, of development to reach its final form. Now, you will notice that chapter 21, for example, in the Gospel according to John is marked off in some Bibles as an epilogue. Why is that? Because chapter 20 seems to have marked originally the end of this Gospel, where John says, I could write much more, but I wrote this much and this is sufficient, basically. Because if I were to write everything, the world would not hold the books. It seems that he intended to end his gospel right there, and then suddenly we find chapter 21. Most biblical scholars today would agree that chapter 21, though present in all of the manuscripts of John's gospel available to us, nevertheless uh, came to be tacked on during the last stage of editing of this gospel. But it's not only chapter 21. More to our point now is chapters 15 to 17. Scholars have noted that chapters 15 to 17 has been inserted as a block between chapters 14 and 18. There are several reasons that led to this conclusion. At the end of chapter 14, Jesus, Jesus anticipates uh, that, uh, that those who are about to arrest him are drawing close. So Jesus brings his speech to a close by saying, I shall no longer speak much with you, for the prince of the world is coming. And then he says, get up, let us leave. Let us leave here and be on our way. That's John chapter 14, verses number 30 to 31. Now, this continues smoothly if we read on, where it says, after this discourse, Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden. The flow of the narrative is smooth. Jesus said he will not speak much more, and he doesn't. He said, get up and let's leave, and he left. He said, let us be on our way, and he's on our way. He's on his way across the Kidron Valley. The problem is that in order to achieve this neat continuation, we had to skip three chapters. We jumped from the end of chapter 14 to the beginning of chapter 18. This indicates that the chapters between chapters 14 and 18 have been squeezed in, pushing these two apart. The three inserted chapters are filled with the speech of Jesus, making it the longest speech anywhere in the Gospels. And it now sits right after Jesus' declaration, I shall no longer speak much with you. So Jesus is at dinner with his disciples, and he says, I shall no longer speak much with you. Get up, let's be going, let's leave here. And then the next chapter, he's still speaking. The following one, he's still speaking. The following one, he's still speaking. Three whole chapters. It's almost like the dinner guest who says, I've got to leave, and uh, he's just talking by the door. Scholars have noticed then that these chapters obviously are an insertion. Some early manuscripts do not have the word much here, where it says, I will not speak to you much more to you. And that initially, the passage said, I shall no longer speak with you. But Raymond Brown thinks that a later scribe, noticing the difficulty, that Jesus says, I shall no longer speak with you, and then suddenly he's speaking for three more chapters, inserted the word much. 
So that blunts the edge of the difficulty. So I won't speak much more with you. Three chapters seems like not too much, at least for the scribe. Now, a clearer indication that this uh, uh, section is a later insertion into this gospel uh, would be found by noticing the, a contradiction between chapters 13 and 16. In chapter 13, verse number 36, Peter asks Jesus where he is going. But then in chapter 16, verse number 5, Jesus complains that none of his disciples are asking him where he is going. And that's in the very same sitting, if we take all of these passages as a smooth continuation. But if we understand then that these three chapters were inserted into the Gospel of John after an initial completion of the Gospel, then we understand that the contradiction came there due to this insertion. One author wrote one thing, another author brought something else in there. Now, the point then of all of this is that when we recognize chapters 15, 16, and 17 as a later insertion, we realize that they could be read differently from chapter 14. In fact, Raymond Brown thinks that these uh, three chapters may actually represent an earlier form of Jesus' saying. Let, let us look at what uh, information we have uh, from this gospel and why it is important now to see uh, how these chapters are read differently. Now, if you're familiar with Muslim Christian discussions over this question, you will be aware that typically a Christian quotes chapter 14, especially verse number 26, to say, look, the paraclete is the Holy Spirit. And the Muslim quotes chapter 16 to say, look, the paraclete is obviously a human being because, look, it refers to the, this person in the male pronoun. Whereas in Greek, the Holy Spirit would be referred to uh, using the neuter gender. So the argument continues with one person referring to chapter 14 and the other referring to chapter 16. By putting before you now the history of the composition of this gospel, I am showing you that, in fact, each is reading a separate saying of Jesus, and in fact, it looks like the Muslim is reading the earlier form of that uh, saying. Raymond Brown has insisted that even though these chapters were inserted later, they're not by virtue of their late insertion, late in origin. He thinks that uh, they come from the same original pool of sayings that were in the first instance included uh, in the gospel. I would argue further that the sayings about the paraclete in the later inserted chapters are closer to Jesus' actual saying uh, than those of chapter 14. Here are my reasons. Brown explains that the idea of the paraclete as the Holy Spirit came about due to two factors. First, the passing away of the original disciples of Jesus meant that they were no longer original witnesses to proclaim the teachings of Jesus and guarantee the authenticity of these teachings. So the disciples passed away and people are asking now, how can we be sure about these things? The original eyewitnesses are no longer here. We need somebody who can verify these uh, events. Second, the fact that Jesus did not return within the lifetime of his disciples, as originally promised, meant a crisis that had to be solved. John's solution, according to Raymond Brown, was to say that Jesus is not coming back. He's already with us as the Holy Spirit. The presence of Jesus as the Holy Spirit also solves the other problem, for he will guarantee that the teachings of Jesus are authentically available in the heart of every Christian. Brown thinks that John was representing the Holy Spirit in such a new light that he had to give it a new name, the paraclete. It seems to me, then, that there is a better explanation for the problems that Brown is trying to solve. Usually in biblical studies, we do not assume that an author introduced the problem. We assume that the author is trying to deal with the problem and he introduces a solution. It is unthinkable, therefore, that John would introduce this term paraclete to solve a problem, hence inventing a bigger problem for people to explain, so that the Bible commentators cannot finish explaining what is meant by paraclete so that they have to keep the original word and break off the commentary in order to explain in a separate appendix what is meant by the paraclete. It seems then that the better solution is to say that the idea of the paraclete was already known. And then John took that idea and made that refer to the Holy Spirit. And this, in fact, is the opinion of several scholars that uh, we will 
encounter in my presentation in the last uh, couple of minutes. But first we must look at John chapter 14 and ask how this came to represent the Holy Spirit. First, look at John chapter 14, verse number 26. Some early versions of John's gospel, such as the old Syriac Sinaiticus, do not have the term holy in this verse. And this is the only verse in John's gospel which specifically identifies the paraclete as the Holy Spirit. C.K. Barrett, the great Christian scholar, in his commentary on the gospel according to John, has said that the original reading, therefore, was simply the paraclete, the spirit. Hence, even in chapter 14, it is possible to see uh, reminiscences of the way in which this uh, saying of Jesus was handled and passed on. It seems that initially it did not say the Holy Spirit and someone inserted the term holy in this verse. Now if it only says spirit, notice that it could be read metaphorically. In fact, Dr. Charles Francis Potter in his book, The Lost Years of Jesus Revealed, writes on the manual of discipline discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I quote him, at times when reading the manual carefully, one gets the impression that the Holy Spirit is synonymous with truth or righteousness or justice and that the Essenes were struggling hard to express and emphasize the importance of this abstract idea without personifying it enough to make it a rival to God. And he continues, perhaps what they were trying to say would be put in this way today. Being baptized by water into the community of the new covenant is not enough. That doesn't wash away your sins. You must really mean it in your heart, in the spirit of truth. Is that only way to enter this fellowship of truth and justice? In the spirit of truth, is that only way to enter this fellowship of truth and justice? And then he continues, whether Jesus meant any more than that when he spoke of the spirit of truth, that would guide his disciples into all truth, we do not know. That is from his pages 123 to 124. Now, though Brown has taken a different view on this, as we have seen, he informs us that the scholars who have held that the paraclete was not originally the, the Holy Spirit. And he tells us, Christian tradition has identified this figure with the Holy Spirit. But scholars like Spida, De La Fosse, Windisch, Sasse, Boltman, and Betts have doubted whether this identification is true to the original picture and have suggested that the paraclete was once an independent salvific figure, later confused with the Holy Spirit. That's on his page 1011, 1135. It would be interesting then for us to see what some of these scholars had to say about uh, this subject. Rudolf Boltmann, in his commentary on John's Gospel, writes, It is clear that the evangelist has taken the figure, has taken the figure, it is clear that the evangelist has taken the figure of the paraclete from his source and interpreted it in the context of Christian tradition as the Hagion Numa the Holy Spirit. That's on his page 566. It, it, and it is clear, he writes further, from chapter 14, verse 16, that the source taught that there were two sendings of two paracletes, Jesus and his successor, the one following another. John Ruman informs us of the opinion of another of these scholars. He writes, Herman Sasse, known now known as a systematician of conservative stamp, argued that the paraclete was a human personality, one filled with the spirit, a prophet who would proclaim Christ and creatively continue his revelation. Just what the author of the fourth gospel did. In that case, the evangelist himself would be the paraclete, even though the final version of the book identifies the paraclete with the spirit. Windisch writes, the paraclete of the second and fifth sayings, on the other hand, deviates widely from his original function. He does not deal with the salvation and the protection of individuals, but with the main thing, the revelation of the teaching of Jesus. His task is teaching, maintaining, and completing the historical revelation in Jesus. He has a definite message to deliver. He is bearer of a tradition already extant and bearer of a new Revelation, supplementing and completing it. 
He is didaskalos and prophetess, teacher of tradition and prophet in one and the same person. That's on his page 17. So then, ladies and gentlemen, I put before you that uh, it is possible to see in all of these descriptions that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is meant. First, that he was the prophet like Moses. Second, that he fulfilled the promise that God made to Abraham and his son Ishmael. Third, that he is the one described in the Song of Solomon, especially in chapter 5, verse number 16, which says he is altogether lovely. Four, that he fulfills the expectation of that prophet that, it is, that is still felt in the New Testament, especially in the pages of the Gospel according to John, the first seven chapters, where people anticipate the coming of that prophet, still the prophet like Moses. And since from Peter's speech it is obvious that Jesus in his first coming did not yet fulfill the demands of the prophet like Moses, meaning that he was not a temporal ruler, and there is an expectation that when he comes back in the glorious days he will be a temporal ruler, therefore we conclude he did not fulfill that prediction and therefore he was not that prophet like Moses. Yet Muhammad therefore has beat him to it and has been the prophet like Moses. And finally, I have shown, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the paraclete mentioned in the Gospel according to John in chapters 15 and 16, when these chapters are read as an earlier form of uh, the saying of Jesus than chapter 14, as I have already demonstrated. Finally, there are many of you who may not require any proof. Why do you need a proof that Muhammad is the prophet of God? The United Church of Canada is one of Canada's largest uh, Protestant denominations. In a recent paper which can be read on their website, uh, they say, Christians cannot, of course, affirm Muhammad as the seal of the prophets. To do so would mean affirming for Christians the primacy of the Quran over the gospel of Jesus. However, we believe that it is possible for Christians to affirm Muhammad as one of a number of unique voices who followed in the prophet traditions of Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, or, in other words, to affirm the prophetic witness of Muhammad, on page 33 of their printed edition. So finally, I put before you that not only can a Muslim see that Muhammad is a prophet of God, but it is possible also for our Christian friends to appreciate the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as they read the pages of the Holy Bible. Thank you very much. So without further ado, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Shroos to, to give us his main presentation on Muhammad in the Bible. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. I greet you in the name of Jesus the Christ, my Lord and Savior and the man from my hometown of Nazareth. We are taught never see friends empty-handed. So I have a very, very special gift for my new friend, Shabir Ali. It is a prayer bead from Jerusalem made of graphite. Uh -huh. Look at it. Thank you. The year was 1991. I was returning from Moscow to New York. The Russian who sat beside me was very excited about flying a Boeing 747 for the first time in his life and going overseas. Boris explained to me that 150 of the people on the plane were part of the Moscow circus visiting the USA for the first time. And he composed their music. Suddenly he stopped, turned and said, Dr. Shirosh, you have an accent, as if he didn't have a heavier accent than mine. <laughs> the interesting thing was, yes, he responded, 
why do you have an accent? I said, due to my education. He said, where did you get it? Many people think because I roll my R's, I am either from Ireland or Scotland. <laughs> but I told him I got my education in Mississippi. He started laughing and roaring because he knew that was really a good joke. May I say that it is with a sense of gratitude to the Heavenly Father that I have come to your great city of Glasgow to spend these very special days with your prayerful support and presence. We can have a very memorable, meaningful, and momentous series of debates which can be a blessing to everybody. Thank you for being with us tonight and for the privilege of addressing you on this very intriguing topic is the claim that Muhammad was foretold in the Old and New Testaments true or false. Mr. Shabi Ali has already presented his case. As far as he's concerned, he has presented an intelligent and very interesting approach to the subject. Allow me to indicate to our Muslim friends that if I believe that the Quran is the word of God, I would certainly join Islam. However, like most Christians, I do not believe it is the word of God. It contains some of the word of God borrowed from the Bible. Please do not be offended if I do not call this great man a prophet. Remember that you do not refer to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when we talk about him or talk about him as Lord Jesus. You call him just a prophet. And we don't mind that. We don't feel offended because we respect your convictions. It is amusing to me that despite the fact that my Muslim debate opponents over the years have accused the Bible with corruption and being changed, and they turn around and use it to provide evidence that their man is really a prophet of God. Is not this an attitude that declares a confession that our Bible is unchanged? We believe that it is also inerrant, inspired, and infallible in its original languages. Upon a very close scrutiny of the alleged references to Muhammad in the Bible as a prophet, any linguistic and faithful researcher will discover that they are basically and fundamentally taken out of context. They absolutely have no relation to the prophet of Muhammad, nor prophesy his coming. Here is what theologians and scholars do diligently study the Bible and the Quran conclude. It is a series of sermons, the Quran, borrowed from the Jewish Old Testament and Christian New Testament. It includes other documents from paganism, from Sabianism and others, which the famous statesman and writer, a man from my homeland, who was more or less a general by the name of Muhammad ibn Abdullah, proclaimed in Mecca and Medina in the 7th century Arabic of the Quraysh tribe with no miracle whatsoever. First of all, we must deal with the Quranic Surah 7, verse 157, those who follow the messenger, the prophet who can neither read nor write, whom they will find described in the Torah and the Gospel, which are with them. Before we go any further, we must recognize that this verse is addressed to the new Muslims who came from the Jewish and Christian backgrounds. Examine the verse very carefully, and you will find that the word they here identifies those who own the Torah, namely the Jews, then the others, which are the Christians who belong to the gospel. We will now seek to find such references in the Old and New Testaments. Have you ever wondered why the Quran never says gospels? It is always singular. We'll talk about that later. Let us analyze the term ummi in Arabic very carefully. The word ummi is translated neither reads nor writes in Pikthal's translation of the Quran. Amazingly enough, in the footnote number eight concerning this verse, Pikthal allows for the translation of ummi to also mean Gentile. Yusuf Ali translates the word immaculate. This is totally misleading because the word describes Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Catholic theology. It actually refers to the Virgin Mary's purity and blameless character. Arthur Erbery translates the Ummi as the prophet of the common folk. Shakir simply uses the very same Arabic word Ummi in his translation. Let me indicate kindly to each one of you tonight that the Arabic word Ummi, as it appears in this context, means non-Jew. The Jews called all other nationalities goyim in Hebrew, which is translated as ummi in Arabic and Gentiles in English. Furthermore, the Jews were called by the Arabs the people of the book because they had a book, the Torah, and could read and write. When the apostle Paul was rejected by the Jews after witnessing to them about Christ, he announced that he would go to the Gentiles with the gospel. 
The word in the Arabic Bible identifying the Gentiles is also Ummi. In Paul's defense in Jerusalem, he uses the same word, Umam, plural of Ummi, as God's call upon his life to serve the Gentiles in Acts 22, 21. Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. This word, Ummi, should not be confused with the Arabic word, Ummah, which means nation or country or a collection of particular race of people. For example, the Arab nation, which is made of over 20 countries, is called al Ummah al Arabiya. In colloquial Arabic, Ummi refers to my mother. In classical Arabic, my mother is Walidati. Although we can call a person who cannot read or write by the same term in Arabic, Ummi, the text in this context does not allow it. Another remarkable substantiation of this possibility is how Muhammad changed the Qibla from Mecca to Jerusalem. He wanted to please the Jews in Medina, 90% of the city were Jews, as he tried to convince them that he was the expected prophet of Deuteronomy 1818, as my good friend mentioned a while ago. How did Muhammad know, by the way, the Hebrew scripture from this passage if the only language he ever knew was Arabic? In addition to all of that, the Quran is replete with biblical events and personalities which were already recorded in the Hebrew scripture 1500 years before Muhammad was born. The only other alternative is that the Jews themselves were feeding him these informations after the, he came to their city of Medina. The proof of that is evident in the Quran because more biblical stories and references and personalities are appearing in the later part of the Quran coinciding with Muhammad's arrival in the residence in Medina from 622 to 632 for 10 years. The Meccan surahs were very complimentary to the Jews and Christians, but not later. Now, now we concentrate on the word prophet as referring to Muhammad. Historically, prophets who spoke in the name of God came only from the Jewish race. Even the Quran testifies to that. Surah 45 verse 16 states, and verily, we gave the children of Israel the scripture and the command and the prophethood and provided them with good things and favored them above all peoples. Surah 29-27 substantiates the fact that the prophethood came only to the descendants of Abraham and the Jewish race. And we bestowed on him Isaac and Jacob and we established the prophethood and the scripture among his seed. Consequently, one must understand by the sovereign act of God, prophethood was limited to the descendants of Abraham through the son of the covenant, Isaac only. In fact, this is what God states in Genesis 17, 17, as a response to Abraham's prayer to bless his son Ishmael by the slave girl Hagar. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, no. Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his, with his descendants after him. Genesis 17, 18 to 19. Abraham's natural and human response to God's promise of giving him a son when he was 99 indicates that he found it difficult to believe that he could have a son at that age. You may remember that Sarah was 90. Incidentally, <laughs> this is the only woman in the Bible whose age is indicated. So ladies, upstairs, downstairs, you don't have to tell anybody your age anymore or for any reason. Subsequently, here is the response of God. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Genesis 17, 20 to 21. Jesus himself confirmed this truth in John 4, 22, when he spoke to the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. In Romans 3, 1 and 2, we find another confirmation. What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the prophet of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly, because to them were committed 
the oracles of God. Was Ishmael another prophet before Muhammad? May I ask my opponent, Mr. Shabir Ali, and every Muslim present here, to explain the following verse from Surah 19, verse 54, and make mention in the scripture of Ishmael. Lo, he was a keeper of his promise, and he was a messenger of Allah, a prophet. Wathkur fil kitab Ismail, innahu kana sadiq al wa'di wa kana rasul nabiyan. Are we to understand that Muhammad cannot be the only prophet from the line of Ishmael when we read this verse, when Ishmael himself is called a prophet in the Quran? Besides that, we want to know if there is anyone in the world, past, present, who can tell us what prophecy did Ishmael ever make? Listen to what the Bible tells us about Ishmael even before he was born. Genesis 16, 11 to 12. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, that's Hagar, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man, his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. Can you imagine what mixed feelings Hagar must have had by such an announcement? It is very curious to read the following statement in Surah 34, 43, 34, 44, where Allah tells Muhammad, and we have given them no scriptures which they study, nor sent we unto them before thee any warner. If the Quran is supposed to be the word of God, and Ishmael is presented as a prophet, and since he is from the Arabs, then we must conclude that there is some contradiction to these statements. On one hand, we are told that Ishmael, the most visible father of the Arab people, is an apostle and a prophet in Surah 1954. Yet in Surah 34, 44, we are told that the Arab people did not have a prophet before Muhammad. The confusion continues when one reads Surah 32, verse 3. Or say they, he hath invented it. Nay, but it is the truth from thy Lord that thou mayest warn a folk to whom no warner came before thee that haply they may walk therein. Am yakuna naftarahu bal huwa al-haqqu min rabbika lutindira qawman ma atainahum min adhirin min qablika la'allahum yahtadun. Every faithful Muslim proclaims daily, I testify there is no God except God and Muhammad is the apostle of God. Isn't it interesting that this very significant shahada does not say that Muhammad is or was ever a prophet of God? Please recognize that a true prophet of God usually talked with God and God talked with him. In Muhammad's case, the claim is made that an angel talked to him. No one ever saw that angel either, not God himself. Additionally, prophets frequently perform miracles, but Muhammad never did. The fanciful stories which the hadith ascribes to Muhammad cannot be verified because they surfaced 250 years after Muhammad. Has God blessed Ishmael and the Arabs as he promised? It is necessary to point out that God promised to bless the world through the son of the covenant, Isaac. But he also promised to bless Ishmael with four special blessings. God's blessing for Ishmael has also been fulfilled according to God's promise in Genesis 17, 20. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, will make him fruitful, multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. Today, the Arab population of the world has been fruitful indeed, equaling over 200 million. Secondly, not only do we have 12 princes or nations, but almost twice that many. Three, the Arab world became a great nation when Islam conquered much of the known world from the 7th to the 12th centuries. Finally, the Arab nation feel quite blessed through massive oil reserves under the vast desert sands. Now, the meaning of the Old Testament reference from your brethren. Many Muslims have considered Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 19 as the powerful proof of the claim that Muhammad is indeed the reference. Thank you. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. 
according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly saying let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God nor let me see this great fire anymore lest I die and the Lord said to me what they have spoken is good I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words which he speaks in my name I will require it of him In analyzing this entire passage, Muslims believe that Ishmael is the half-brother of Isaac, which is precisely what the Bible teaches. They further consider that in as much as the Quraysh tribe of Muhammad, descended from the tribe of Kedar, who is one of the twelve sons of Ishmael, this prophecy refers to him. The first expression we must discuss is your brethren, or their brethren. In the biblical context, we find the following statements which should clarify the expression to everyone very exquisitely tonight. Judges 20:13, but the children of Benjamin would not listen to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. This is as clear a statement to what the Bible means by the term the brethren that one can find. In other words, brethren refers to other tribes within the 12 tribes of Israel. Numbers 8:26, they may minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of meeting to attend to needs, but they themselves shall do no work. Thus you shall do to the Levites regarding their duties. Again, we find that this is the instruction to the retired Levites to serve their brethren, the children of Israel, as watchmen at the tabernacle. Deuteronomy 17, 15. You shall surely sit a king, you shall surely set a king over you, whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your brethren, you shall set as king over you, you may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Therefore, God's instruction is to appoint a king over Israel from among the Israelites, not a foreigner, Edomite or Ishmaelite. The reason for this clear instruction is that such a person must be one of their brethren and a member of one of the tribes of Israel. Somehow, my Muslim friends, whether scholars or otherwise, fail to notice verse 15 of this Mosaic prophecy. To overwhelm you and me with the above-mentioned accurate interpretation, look at the expression, from your midst. If there were Arabs in the tribes of Israel, then maybe the expression would involve Ishmael. However, the 12 tribes had grown to become the nation of Israel over a period of 400 years while they were in Egypt without Ishmael or his descendants. The first father of the Arabs was Joktan, five generations before Abraham was born. The second was Ishmael. It's very important to remember that historically, Ishmael, as a representative of the Arabs, had an Egyptian mother. Therefore, he cannot accurately be considered father of the Arabs like Joktan was. Then came the six sons of Abraham and Keturah. What about the descendants of Lot, Abraham's nephew? Yes, more Arabs claim Lot as another forefather. Even Esau, the twin brother of Jacob, became another forefather of the more Arabs. This explains why there are so many Arabs today. We must conclude that an Ishmaelite would be automatically disqualified. We must conclude that an Ishmaelite would be automatically disqualified from being the prophet whose coming was foretold in that scripture. Inasmuch as Moses was from the tribe of Levi, the coming prophet should come from one of the other tribes of Israel. According to Matthew 1, 2, Hebrews 7, 14, Jesus of Nazareth qualified perfectly because he was from the tribe of Judah, among other numerous qualifications. Who is the prophet who can be a perfect match like Moses? The second major consideration is the declaration that the future prophet will not only be from among their brethren, but also like Moses himself. Let's now look at the similarities between Moses and Jesus. We'll demonstrate sincerely, succinctly, and biblically how only Jesus of Nazareth, our Lord and Savior, is the only person in the universe who qualifies as the expected prophet like Moses. First, Jesus as a lawgiver. Moses was a great lawgiver for his nation. Jesus the Messiah taught on his own authority the laws of God and elevated their observance to a higher level. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 are the most sublime of ethical laws in the history of the human race. It is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 43 to 44. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love 
your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. It is very crucial to our understanding that this conviction of the Jews found in Leviticus 19.18 and Deuteronomy 23.3-6 is what God gave to Moses as part of the Mosaic law. Besides the elevation of this ancient and divine moral law, no one but no one should ever miss the fantastic point when Jesus announced, but I say to you, Jesus emphasized this statement six times, six times, as he dealt with six subjects in Matthew 5, without a doubt, Jesus the Messiah puts himself on equal footing with God Almighty. He was the incarnate deity who spoke to Moses 2,000 years earlier and now speaks to humanity in flesh and blood. Jesus was demonstrating progressive revelation. Moses gave the Ten Commandments. Jesus also gave a new commandment, which is found in John 13, 34 to 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another. Jesus matched Moses by being the light and bringing liberty. Moses' face was aglow with light, according to Exodus 34, 29 to 35, but it faded away. The face of Jesus shined like the sun, according to Matthew 17, 1 to 5, and is still shining like the sun while in heaven, according to Revelation 1, 9 to 19. Moses delivered his brethren out of physical slavery into liberty and the promised land. Jesus delivered his followers out of the spiritual slavery of sin and Satan into the realm of the glorious home in heaven. Similarity of their birth. Moses was born when his brethren were oppressed by Pharaoh. Jesus was born when his brethren were oppressed by the Roman Empire. Moses was born in a country where a man was worshipped as a god. Jesus was born in a country where the Roman Caesar was worshipped as a god. Moses was nursed a short time at his birthplace, then he was moved to safety, Exodus 2. Jesus was nursed a short time in Bethlehem, then was taken to Egypt for safety, Matthew chapter 2. Similarity of parental background and upbringing. The father of Moses was a mystery to the general public in Egypt. The father of Jesus and the fact of his virgin birth were a mystery to the population of ancient Palestine, Luke 1. Moses was adopted in the royal family of Pharaoh. According to the angel's instructions, Joseph adopted Jesus and he himself was from the royal family line of King David, Matthew 1. Moses divested himself from his royal upbringing to serve his brethren, according to Hebrews 11, 23, 29. Jesus left his glory in heaven and came to earth to serve humanity, according to Matthew 4, 8 to 11. Similarity of personal background. Moses was tested in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus was tested in the wilderness for 40 days, then ministered for nearly 40 months with teaching, preaching, and healing the sick. Two, Moses' hand was struck with leprosy and then was healed by God, Exodus 4, 6 to 7. Jesus healed many lepers, according to Luke 11:19, 19, many times. Intercession for the people. Moses begged God to forgive the sin of his people, Exodus 32, 31 to 32. On the cross, Jesus cried out to his heavenly Father to forgive the sin of his people, Luke 23, 34. Both heard God's voice speaking distinctly to them. Moses experienced the voice of God speaking to him as a witness of his authority and observed the cloud of God's presence. Jesus was in the cloud on Mount Tabor and heard the voice of God declaring that Jesus is his son, Matthew 17, 24 to 25. Both had power over nature and performed miracles. Moses exercised power over nature at the Red Sea, Exodus 14. Jesus walked on the water of Galilee and calmed the waves, Matthew 14. Moses brought water from a rock, Exodus 17. Jesus himself was the living water and he brought spiritual living water out of the tomb of rocks where he arose, John 7, 37 to 38. Moses fed multitudes by miracles as we find in Exodus 16. So did Jesus as we find in Matthew 14 and 15. The role of fire was similar. Supernatural fire was associated with Moses at Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai, Exodus 3, 1 to 6, and others. Then there was the pillar of fire, according to Exodus 13, 21 to 22. Jesus baptized the people with the Holy Spirit and fire on the day of Pentecost, according to Matthew 3, 11, and Acts 2, 1 to 4. The historic blood covenant was similar. Moses ratified God's covenant with his people by the blood of a lamb, According to Exodus 24, 8, Jesus declared to his disciples, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five. 25. 
Both were faithful servants. Moses was faithful as a servant, Hebrews 3.5. So was Jesus, Hebrews 3.6. Angels watched over the graves. According to Jude 9, an angel watched over the dead body of Moses. According to John 20, there were two angels watching over the body of Jesus. Their tombs have similar stories. Deuteronomy 34 tells us that the tomb where the body of Moses is located is unknown. The tomb of Jesus is empty because he was raised up to heaven, as we find in Luke 24, 50 to 53. Both reappeared. Finally, and amazingly, Moses reappeared to other people after his death with Elijah and Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration. As we find in Matthew 17, 3, Jesus our Lord also reappeared 13 different times after his death. Luke 24, John 20, and 21. Three distinguishing factors of the prophet like Moses. In order to be a prophet like Moses, my dear friends, the person must match the three remarkable and outstanding characteristics of Moses and his ministry. Number one, Moses spoke to God face to face. Exodus 33, 11. Jesus demonstrated that through the vision of Isaiah, John 12, 41. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Muhammad never claimed he got the messages from God directly, but from an angel. Secondly, Moses performed great signs and wonders. Deuteronomy 34, 10 to 12. Jesus performed 40 great signs and wonders according to the Gospels and the book of Acts. Surah 6, 37 tells us, they say, why hath no portent been sent down upon him from his Lord? The word portent is the same as the word, as the word sign. Moses was a direct mediator between God and his people. Exodus 20, 18 to 19. Jesus too was a direct mediator between God and the redeemed believers. 1 John 2, 1, Hebrews 7, 25. Muhammad did not occupy that position because the angel was his inspirer. Now, additional significant proofs that Jesus is indeed the prophet like Moses. What Jesus said. Any student of the Bible will always remember the precise announcement of Jesus identifying himself as the one of whom Moses spoke. John 5, 46 gives the exact quotation. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me, not about Muhammad. What God on high said. Neither should we forget God's declaration, Deuteronomy 18.15, that the prophet like Moses is the one the people should hear. The heavenly father announced from his glory the very fulfillment of this revelation and ratification. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Hear him. Matthew 17.5. Of course, as everybody knows, Muhammad was never given such a title as my beloved son. So are we to hear the great man from Mecca, who has been dead for 1400 years, or Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the living God, who is alive and is coming back someday? Surface similarities of Arabia's prophet and Moses. We are all aware that Muhammad was a lawgiver, a military leader, and a spiritual guy. But that does not qualify him nor identify him as a prophet like Moses. Secondly, they believe that Moses and Muhammad were initially rejected by their own people, returned later from exile to become the religious and secular leaders of their nation, still does not qualify Muhammad as a prophet like Moses. Third, the immediate and successful conquest of the land of Palestine after their deaths by their followers does not in any way qualify Muhammad as a prophet like Moses. As we conclude this important section, we must admit the supreme uniqueness of Jesus over against the whole human race, and not only like mighty Moses. Was Muhammad bilingual? Did Muhammad speak Arabic only? For those of you tonight who believe that Muhammad spoke only Arabic, a very simple question must be asked. In Arkeho Lagas, how many of you understood what I said? Raise your hand, please. One, that's it. What I said, if you understood Greek, you would have immediately known because I said to you, one one of John in the beginning was the word. Now then, how can anyone claim that Muhammad was the prophet like Moses, supposedly sent to the Jews when he knew only the Arabic language? We read the statement again from Deuteronomy, I will raise up for them. 
to underscore the focus of the ministry of the prophet like Moses, God announces in this passage for them meaning for the Jews, not the Arab people. Period. Did Muhammad also know Hebrew? <laughs> now for those of you who believe that Muhammad was a highly educated man like I do, and indeed very knowledgeable man like I do, how do you like this theory? Has it ever occurred to you that the greatest genius in the history of my people, in the Arab world, was so highly educated that he may have known Hebrew for sure? Medina's population was 90% Jewish. How did Muhammad communicate with them for 10 years? Why does the Quran refer to the people of the book or the book 200 times? Why does the Quran insist that it is an Arabic Quran because there was a Jewish Quran? It is because it because Muhammad was actually interpreting the Jewish Torah from Hebrew to Arabic. Did Waraka bin Nofal teach him Hebrew for 15 years after he got married to Khadija? How many of you can answer the following question? What did Muhammad do for 15 years after he married Khadija? Pray tell me. He actually became a part of the aristocracy of Mecca. Ibn Hisham, volume 1, page 174, states that he was able to spend one month a year at the Hira Caves studying with Waraka bin Nofal. Waraka was the bishop of the Nestorian church in Mecca, as well as the uncle of Khadija, and he was grooming him to be his successor. He also performed their wedding ceremony according to volume 1, page 155 and 363 of Asir al halabiya Additionally, Muhammad became a part of the Hanifites, who were the leading intellectuals in Mecca and believed in the one true God, being with them expanded his spiritual understanding, religious information, and horizon. Are you aware that Waraka was knowledgeable in Hebrew and had translated a forgery of a gospel by a Jew called the Gospel of Matthew? How long does it take you to learn another language? As bright and as intelligent as Muhammad was, he could have earned several doctor's degrees in 15 years of study and he lived in our modern era. I was privileged to earn my first doctor's degree in six months, the second one in 10 months. In other words, he could have easily learned Hebrew at the hands of Waraka and could converse with the Jews, whether they lived in Mecca or Medina. Any casual reading of the Quran reveals how references to the Old Testament were made frequently. How did Muhammad know these references and biblical stories? Pray tell me, if he did not know Hebrew, there was no Arabic translation of the Old Testament whatsoever. The document of the Quran is confused and disjointed because Muhammad died unexpectedly and could not edit his research of 23 years. If you have ever written a book, you would understand that research takes a long time. I speak from experience, just finished my 10th book in September. Then the arrangement of the material takes even more time and this is why the Quran and its passages hardly give us a continuous story from beginning to end, but bits and pieces here and there disjointed. Can Muhammad remotely be considered the Holy Spirit or the Comforter? We will now discuss the famous statement in Surah 61.6. And when the son of Mary, and when Jesus, son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, lo, I am messenger of Allah unto you, confirming that which was revealed before, before me in the Torah, and bringing good tidings of a messenger who cometh after me, whose name is the praised one. Let us present the biblical reference to the term the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16 to 17, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. John 14, 26, but the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. John 15, 26, but when the Comforter comes, whom I shall send you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me. John 16, 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The translation of the Holy Spirit's duty and function from the Greek word parakletos is helper, counselor, advocate, and comforter. It's very interesting that some Muslim scholars somehow say that the original word was perikletos. Such a Greek word would mean the praised one or Ahmed in Arabic. One has to wonder why the fuss over such a word when none of the manuscripts of nearly 20,000, 25,000 copies in existence has it perikletos. Ahmed is not Muhammad. 
Even if we agree that the prediction of Jesus, that the name of so-called prophet that would come after him would be called Ahmed, that certainly is not the name of Muhammad. Let me illustrate, all right? You are Ahmed, you are Muhammad, okay? Would Ahmed stand, please? Why didn't you stand? Because it's not your name. Thank you. The fact is, the word Ahmed was given to Muhammad only 50, 150 years after he died, and Muslims began to use that name as another name for Muhammad. The biblical meaning of the text. Now let's look more closely at the description of this person who is not another human personality, but is definitely a spirit. Jesus promised that the Heavenly Father would send another comforter. The geographical context was Jerusalem, not Mecca. The historical context was 33 AD, not 632 AD. The intended recipients are the disciples, not Muhammad. He will give you another comforter. That should indicate that Jesus himself has the title as comforter also. John 14, 18 states, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. When Jesus said, you know him, tells us that the disciples knew the Spirit because they observed the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus. Amazingly, the Quran concurs with that by declaring that Jesus was a Spirit from God. This comforter is supposed to be with the disciples forever. Muhammad died in the year 632 and his tomb is in Medina to this day. The Holy Spirit would never leave the disciples of Jesus nor his future followers but would be with them forever. When we read the words, he dwells with you, it certainly does not refer to human beings like Muhammad, because he never met the disciples. John 1.32 states, and John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. Acts chapter 2 gives greater detail about this fact. Jesus told his disciples that this comforter would be in you. And as much as the Spirit was in Jesus, so would the Holy Spirit be within the disciples. Did Muhammad get inside the disciples' hearts? Of course not. According to Acts 2, 3 to 4, the fulfillment of the promise of Jesus to the disciples as to sending the Holy Spirit is obvious. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Non-biblical meaning of the text by Muslims. May I remind my intelligent audience of the futility of attempting to equate the Holy Spirit with Muhammad by believing that Ahmed was the reference rather than the Holy Spirit. Arabic is not the language of the New Testament, it is Greek. We are not dealing with just a word, namely parikletos, neither perikletos. It is true that the Arabic translation of the word perikletos means the praised one, but the New Testament was written in Greek, not in Arabic. Furthermore, the fulfillment of what Jesus promised was experienced by the early disciples and continues to be experienced by any individual who confesses his sins, repents of his sins, makes Jesus savior and Lord of his life and enjoy a relationship with God Almighty as his Heavenly Father. Thank you and God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to uh, thank you again for uh, your patient listening and Dr. Shiroz, thank you for your scholarly presentation. Now, you will recall, folks, that I gave five reasons for thinking that the Bible, both the Old and New Testament, speak of Muhammad, peace be upon him. First, that he was a prophet like Moses uh, from Deuteronomy. Second, that he fulfilled uh, the expectation and the promise that God uh, left with Abraham and Ishmael. Uh, third, that he is uh, the one described in the Song of Solomon, especially in chapter 5, verse 16, where his name is echoed in the Hebrew text. Uh, fourth, that he fulfills that expectation which we still see lingering in the opening chapters of John's Gospel and even into Acts of the Apostles, even after Jesus had already left the scene, we find Peter speaking about uh, the time of refreshing when that prophet will come. And uh, that, I have said, is obviously a reference to the prophet Muhammad. And fifth, that uh, Muhammad uh, is that paraclete that is spoken about in John chapters 15 and 16 when these are read as an earlier form of Jesus' saying about the paraclete than is found in John chapter 14. Now, how did Dr. Shorosh respond to these specific points? As far as I can see, although Dr. Shorosh has made many points, he only dealt directly with two of these areas. For example, he did not touch at all upon the uh, the, the Song of Solomon uh, argument. 
and uh, I would be delighted to hear what he has to say about that. Definitely. Now, as for the ones that he did uh, deal with, let me give some of my brief uh, responses to his points. First, about Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, the brethren of the Israelites. Dr. Shorosh quoted passages from the Bible to show that brethren means another tribe. But none of these passages show that the brethren means only another Israelite tribe. So if Benjamin is brothers of Israel, that helps to establish my point, in fact that there could be others also who are not within the same family and they're still brethren. Brethren could be extended wider and there's no need to limit it. Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 15 about a king who must be from among the brethren of the Israelites, that's about a king, not necessarily a prophet. And what is specified there does not have to be extended everywhere. Moreover, even if you read it on Dr. Shirosh's reading, it doesn't say that uh, it must be from Israelites. That's Dr. Shirosh's words, that the king must be from the Israelites. If it says, a brethren who must be one of your kinsmen, well then that was what the prophet Muhammad was. He was from the Israelites who was from the kinsmen, as I have already demonstrated with the biblical reference. I've shown that according to the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the Edomites were the brethren of the Israelites, by virtue of the fact that their forefathers were brothers of each other. Similarly, the Ishmaelites are the brethren, I have argued, of the Israelites because they had a singular, uh, they had a similar sort of connection of their forefathers. Second, Ishmael, he says, is not the only father of the Arabs. That is not necessary to my argument. What is only necessary is that Ishmael is the forefather of Muhammad, and therefore Muhammad is from the brethren of the Israelites. And according to Dr. Shirosh's own writing, that holds true. So he makes points, but with no avail. He says that uh, Jesus uh, has been identified in the New Testament as that prophet like Moses. I already admitted that, but that does not go against my argument. I've said that even though people thought it was Jesus, obviously Muhammad fulfills that much more, and there are other indications in the New Testament itself, especially in Acts of the Apostles chapter 3, that Jesus did not actually quite do or meet the qualifications. Fourth, he said that the similarity between Moses and Jesus are numerous. What he doesn't realize is that in quoting the New Testament to show the similarity, he is quoting a, a point of view uh, the, of a Christian writer who deliberately tried to make Jesus look like Moses. And this is widely acknowledged in biblical scholarship. If you read any introduction to the Gospel according to Matthew, uh, presented in our present century, you will find the authors admitting that Matthew has deliberately styled it so. So you have this great Sermon on the Mount. Why is it the Sermon on the Plain in Luke and not the Sermon on the Mount? They say that Matthew has deliberately gathered all of that material and made it into one sermon and has Jesus sitting on the mountain to deliberately resemble Moses. So it's not that Jesus actually did this in fact, but that the author wants to present him like Moses by one way or another. As John Dominic Crossan puts it, what we have in these Gospels about Jesus in this regard is not uh, history memorized, but prophecy historicized. In other words, the writers did not try to find out what really happened, but they read the Old Testament to find out what should have happened, and then they wrote that. So you cannot then use that as a proof that Jesus actually was the person like Moses. The essential point of similarity with Moses is that he was a statesman in addition to a prophet. He was a lawgiver introducing a new code, a new covenant, a new book. And that is what Muhammad did. Whereas Jesus only said, you have heard that? Okay, I'll tell you about the spirit of things. But he did not introduce a new commandment. New commandment of love? That was always there. But he, Jesus did not give a new set of Ten Commandments, but you quoted Matthew chapter 5, Dr. Shirosh. Read further in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus said, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill. And he said, whoever breaks the smallest one of these commandments will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, Jesus, like the prophets before him, had to follow the Mosaic law. Muhammad did not follow the Mosaic law directly, but he got a new revelation with a new law in a new book. And that is why James Dow, in his Collins Gem Dictionary of the Bible, identified Muhammad as the only person, as you've heard me quote before, who is like Moses. I say that my case there is quite strong. 
Now, he says that Jesus' tomb was empty and he reappeared to his disciples. But in fact, as I will show when we deal with the crucifixion and resurrection, that uh, there were good reasons for thinking that that is in fact not so. That even though it is written so in the Gospels, that is not believable. Uh, sixth, he said that uh, there are three factors. One, that uh, the prophet must speak to God directly like Moses did. But if you read the ancient Jewish commentaries on this, like the Sifri on Deuteronomy, for example, they specifically say that that is excluded. They said that the prophet like Moses will not be spoken to directly by God, but that the Holy Spirit will come to his mouth. And that's, that's why it says, I will put my words in his mouth. And that obviously Muhammad fulfilled. So I think that Dr. Shirosh has made uh, some very important points, but at the same time, the points do not hold up against my argument. Now, was uh, Muhammad a mediator? Yes, he was a mediator between God and human beings in terms of bringing their message. And in that sense, that is what Jesus was as well. Jesus should not be conceived of as a mediator in the sense that he stands between God and people and makes God change his mind. Because Muslim, Christian, and Jewish theologians agree that nobody can make God change his mind. So there is no mediator in the Abrahamic traditions between God and man. We speak to God directly and we confess our sins to him directly. We do not need someone to die for our sins as a mediator because God can forgive our sins directly and he does not lose anything by doing so. He, Dr. Shirosh asks, What's, what was the uh, wonder or the miracle of Muhammad? It is the Quran which we can examine today. If you say that Jesus performed miracles, well, people may say, well, show me those miracles. Many theologians and church leaders today deny that Jesus walked on water or raised the dead or that he was even born of a virgin or even that he was resurrected physically back to life. All of these miracles might be denied because they're not here to be examined and felt. But the Quran is the lasting miracle of Muhammad, which continues to convince Muslims of his divine mission, even if others are still wondering about it. Seven, uh, he gives more proofs that Jesus is like uh, Moses. And he says that Jesus said that Moses wrote of, of me. But again, uh, many theologians would look at that and say that Jesus here, uh, this could not have been God because he seems to think that Moses actually wrote something about him, whereas in fact the Torah as we have it today was written much later, uh, later than Moses, as is known from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 34, where it describes the death of, of Moses. Now he thinks that Muhammad is dead and Jesus is alive and that proves uh, something about Jesus and something negative about the prophet Muhammad. But the fact that the prophet is dead, folks, does not mean that that is a false prophet. Moses is a dead prophet, but he's not a false prophet. Jesus is alive not by his own doing, but by the grace of God, Muslims believe. And that makes God the miracle worker and Jesus uh, the object. God is the one who has uh, kept him alive. Now, Jesus, he thinks, was declared the son of God. But that, of course, is reading back uh, the, the later understanding about Jesus into the Gospels. If God had really declared before a massive crowd, this is my beloved son, you should listen to him, do you think thereafter there would be any doubt about Jesus? But there was, of course, many doubts about him, and people tried to kill him, which means that historically he was not recognized as the son of God during his lifetime in the manner in which Christians have now come to understand him. That is a later understanding that the readers then read back in to the Gospels. Again, they didn't ask what happened, they asked what should have happened. So they went to Psalm, the second Psalm, and they saw that David was called the Son of God, where, Jesus, where God said to David, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. And then they wrote that into the life of Jesus, and they picked the occasion of his baptism. This is not historical fact, but in fact uh, historical, uh, or, or rather, uh, the, the, it's not history memorized, but prophecy historicized. Now, uh, Dr. Shirosh uses uh, a lot of what we would call a straw man arguments. He uh, refers to things that I did not say, and he attacks those. Well, that's the peril of the prepared speech. I wish he would put his speech away. He would think about what I'm saying, make notes, and then come back and respond specifically to what I have said. I did not argue that Muhammad and Moses are similar in the ways in which he has said, which he has proceeded then to demolish. Uh, when you cannot demolish the opponent, you create a straw representation of him, and you knock that down because that's easy. That was not my point, folks. So he has to respond to the points I made. Now, he was reciting from John chapter 1, verse 1, and at first I said I didn't know what he was saying. 
Because the way I have learned John 1.1 1, 1 is like this. En arche en hologos. Kai hologos en prostantheon. Kai theos en hologos. I didn't recognize the Greek that uh, Dr. Shiroz was reading. But how could he, the Prophet Muhammad, be a, a prophet uh, for the Jews if he was speaking Arabic? Here, Dr. Shiroz has ignored their own method of interpreting the scriptures. When in Deuteronomy... Uh, the prophet Moses says to those who were listening to him that this prophet will be in your midst. It's not the same people Christians understand now because those people have long died. In claiming that Jesus was that prophet like Moses, no one should object, well, wait a minute, Jesus was not among those people who have long died. In a similar way, when we say that Muhammad is the fulfillment of that prophecy, you cannot now turn it around and object that Muhammad is not in the midst of those people. He didn't speak the language of those people. They couldn't hear him and so on. Naturally, Muhammad could have presented a message which would then reach others either by translation or by the very fact that they also knew the language. Uh, did uh, Muhammad communicate with the Jews to learn their scriptures? There is no doubt that Muhammad was an intelligent man, and he must have been aware of his environment, about other scriptures, about other teachings. But the Quran insists that he was not uh, trained to read or write. He was uh, an unlettered prophet. And the Quran says that he did not write the book with his own hand, otherwise others might doubt. And that uh, is an insistence that the Prophet Muhammad uh, did not uh, compose the scripture because obviously he couldn't. He had other people uh, even write down the words for him. Now, did he learn from Waraka bin Naufal? I believe that Dr. Sharosh wants to prove by one way or another that uh, the Prophet Muhammad learned from others, and so he uh, supposes, suppose that Waraka bin Naufal was uh, a Nestorian monk who taught the Prophet Muhammad Hebrew for 15 years. You can suppose a lot of things. In the Da Vinci Code, it is supposed that the, uh, Jesus went along with Mary and, and had a child and the bloodline survives in France or wherever. You can support a lot of things, but as the New Testament scholar Bart Ehrman uh, puts it nicely in his book on this, one has to have real facts and evidence. You cannot quote uh, a 13th century book like Sira al halabiya You have to go to the original documents, Dr. Shirosh, and find out what was Maraka bin Naufal, not the suppositions of others that agree with your own suppositions positions. Now, again with the straw man argument, I didn't make any reference to Periclitus, so there is no need for you to argue against that. I only spoke about Paracletus. I showed that that word itself means a prophet if we trace the meaning correctly, and I've shown that that uh, statement actually refers to the prophet Muhammad. Moreover, I was not referring to chapter 14 as proving Muhammad. Therefore, to go to chapter 14 and show, look, this means the Holy Spirit and the Spirit is in you, and that is not not Muhammad. I have already conceded all of that. What you have to deal with Dr. Shirosh is chapters 15 and 16, and you have to read them as an earlier form of Jesus' saying, or to show why that could not be read as an earlier form of Jesus' saying. And for that, you have to cite Christian biblical scholars, like I have cited, to show that what I have presented is uh, incorrect. Now, Finally then, I think that uh, Dr. Shirosh, uh, though he has made many points, has not actually dealt with uh, my most significant and important points. And in fact, where he did uh, make some uh, points, he has not in fact de dealt with my uh, points by way of demolishing them. So finally, I think that my five points still hold up. First, that the Prophet Muhammad is that prophet like Moses. Just like uh, James Dow has said, and just like uh, William Montgomery Watt has allowed for. And I've shown that uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, fulfills that expectation to uh, Ishmael. And in fact, Dr. Shirosh has admitted this, because he said, you heard him, that with the rise of Islam, that was fulfilled. What, 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 what caused the rise of Islam except the prophecy of Muhammad, peace be upon him? Uh, Dr. Shirosh uh, thinks that uh, one has to uh, speak a prophecy about the future, but that's not the definition of prophet, as you heard me quote from reputable authorities. And so Ishmael could have been a prophet, and yet Muhammad is a prophet. Ishmael could be a prophet and not uh, have any sayings about the future. He doesn't have to. And uh, yet Muhammad could be a prophet to his immediate environment, so that when the Quran says that he is sent to a people to whom no prophet has come, it means then that in the in immediate history of these people, they were not privy to the divine revelation. And therefore Muhammad is sent as a fresh prophet. Is the Quran really borrowed uh, from the Bible? Uh, my answer to that is no. 
The Quran is a revelation given to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And if we see similarity between the Quran and the Bible, which there are, we shouldn't see this as borrowing. We should see this as improving, if you want to use a term. Because you, if you compare the stories in the Quran and the Bible, one for one, you will see that uh, invariably the Quran is improving upon the stories in the Bible. And so if the Bible is the word of God, the Quran is even more so an improved Word of God. Now, if the Bible is corrupted, how can we use it as evidence? I've shown that we can look at the Bible critically, we can reconstruct its history, we can find out what was said before its final form. We can find out, for example, what did Jesus say or how was it represented earlier than it is now in the Bible. And even though we can hold that there are corruptions and changes in the Bible as it now stands, it is possible also uh, to see that as much as we can reconstruct the original form of the Bible and of Jesus' saying, when he spoke about the paraclete, he really spoke about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to come after him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and what a delight it is to be with you and share this time together for the next three days, besides tonight. And we'll be covering the materials that he shared with you, and I think we'll have a splendid time. Thank you very much, sir. I would like to follow up with the last point he made. The last word he used, Perikletos. Here is how the Holy Spirit is presented in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. First, he is the third person of the Trinity, according to Matthew 28, 18. He is the inspirer of Scripture, 2 Peter 1, 21. He is the companion of Christian believers, John 16, 7. He is the convictor, convincer, converter of sinners, John 16, 9 to 11. Nowhere any close to Muhammad. The heavenly gift, Acts 10.45. The one who indwells the believer, 1 Corinthians 3.16. The seal of God's approval in the believer, Ephesians 4.30. The down payment of the believer's inheritance, Ephesians 1.13-14. The anointer of believers, 2 Corinthians 1.21-22. Certainly Muhammad never did that. The baptizer of believers, 1 Corinthians 12.13. The one who must fill believers, Ephesians 5.18. The one who calls individuals to God's service, Acts 13, 2 to 3. The giver of special gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11. The producer of spiritual fruits in believers, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. The Holy Spirit is God, Acts 5, 3 to 4. And certainly no Muslim will call Muhammad God. The Holy Spirit in the Quran. It is very intriguing to learn what the Quran identifies as the Holy Spirit. In Surah 1529, we are told that the Holy Spirit is God's own breath. But in Surah 1917, we find something else. He's identified as the angel Gabriel. Additionally, in Surah 16:2, he is divine inspiration. What more of a confused presentation can one glean from the Quranic understanding of the Holy Spirit? Please tell me. Possible interpretations of Surah 61:6. How else can we explain the Muslim misunderstanding of this particular verse in the Quran, Surah 61, 6? And when Jesus, son of Mary, said, O children of Israel, Lo, I am the messenger of Allah unto you, confirming that which was revealed before me in the Torah, bringing good tidings of a messenger who cometh after me, whose name is the praised one. By many scholars, the idea is, they believe that this verse is an interpolation of a later period. In the light of the recently discovered Yemenite scrolls in 1972, covering the entire Quran from the 8th century all the way through the 14th centuries as they were renovating the great mosque in Sana'a, and the scrolls were depicted, explained, and exposed in the Atlantic Monthly. You can look that on your computer. Atlantic Monthly of January 1999, which reported very clearly after almost 30 years of study that the Quran actually was developed over the centuries. The Arabic copy of the Quran, which is displayed at the museum, actually part, which I say, the library of uh, the great British library, displayed there, it states that it was either from the 9th or 10th century. They don't have anything old. But now with these, it's very exciting. Another possibility is that we can call this verse a self-fulfilled prophecy. 
to enhance the position of Muhammad as he presented himself to the Jewish and Christian tribes in Arabia as a promised prophet. Now, to deal with the matters my dear friend has brought before you, I'd like for you to listen to this verse he claims from the whole book of the Song of Solomon, which every Jewish couple who are to be married must read before they get married, because it is about marriage and love within the framework of marriage. You can spiritualize it, but the truth is, I read these verses to you from chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, and remember please, I'm reading English, all right? The Old Testament is in Hebrew, not in Arabic. For him to jump up and declare that one word in the whole book identifies Muhammad when the word means Hamad Allah, Ahmad Allah, I praise God. Listen to this. It says here, his mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Has nothing to do with Mecca, nothing to do with Muhammad, nothing to do with Islam, nothing to do with Muslims. This is the Bible written for the Jews, by the Jews, by the inspiration of God. Another interesting thing I'd like to mention is that it talks about prophets. There is a prophet, and there is a Messiah, and there is Elijah, and all this thing. The fact is, when we come to that point on the last day, when we have a comparison between the Bible and Jesus and the Quran and Muhammad, I will explain to you that there is no way under the sun you can figure out anything else but the fact that the Jews believed Jesus was both the prophet and the Messiah. There is no difference between them. As for the third personality, he's identified as the spirit of Elijah by the name of John the Baptist. We call Yahya in the Arabic Quran. Now, coming to this interesting part about the Holy Spirit of chapter 14. In Acts 1.8, to identify for you the mistake my good friend has made, I'd like to show you here from chapter 1 when he says that only in this place it's called Holy Spirit. Well, here is chapter 1 of the book of Acts, and here is the verse Jesus is speaking before he left for heaven. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The Holy Spirit is not a man. The Holy Spirit is not a prophet. The Holy Spirit is spirit, the spirit of the living God. Now, as for mediator, I'd like to inform you, ladies and gentlemen, that I stand here to shock you to reality. If God Almighty will not change his mind, why do you pray? Why do I pray? We are told here that this man Moses pleaded with God when God said they have broken my laws and I'm so upset with them. Moses broke the Ten Commandments, you remember? And he said to God, if you will not forgive the sin, take my life. He stood in the gap. He was the mediator for his own nation. And as a result, God changed his mind. If God does not change his mind, ladies and gentlemen, he is a monolith and he is not my God. My God is a loving father who responds to prayer. Why does he teach me the words? Our father who art in heaven. If he does not care about his children to answer their needs and their prayers, stop going to the mosque. Don't go to the church. Close the doors here. Go home. This is not a ritual. He was a mediator. So was Jesus. And as a result of the prayer of Jesus on the cross, all of you remember, the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, shook Jerusalem. 3,000 were saved in one day. The next few days, 5,000, then 10,000. Within 150 years, 200 years, even the Roman Empire bowed its knees to the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the Son of God, the living Son of God. May I remind you also that I believe that Jesus was recognized in Psalms 2. Why in the world does my precious friend declare that this is about David? When the apostles mentioned it was about Jesus, when Hebrews chapter 1 talks about it as Jesus, why in the world he jumps to this conclusion? So let me read to you what the scripture says. Because it is always important to go to the original text. It says here, very clearly, why do the nations rage? 
And the people plot a vain thing. The things of the earth, the kings of the earth, set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, the kings of the earth, David was king of a little place called Israel. Let us break their bonds in pieces. Is the human race, doesn't want to know God. And cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king. God is speaking, not David. Yet I have set my king. Where? On my holy mount, Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has set to me. Listen carefully now, the personalities here. You are my son. Today I have begotten you as Oh, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter vessel. This is a reference to who? To Jesus. Follow through. Now therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. Where is David here? He's nowhere. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Beautiful indeed. Now, I would like to remind you again about this business of Moses in her midst. When the scripture was written, spoken by Moses, he was speaking to the people right there before him. Your midst, that means your people, your brethren, these people. And I do not believe that it is very clear to accept what our dear brother has been saying about the Arabs being the ones. No way. I'd like to also mention to you that as far as the point he was making concerning the refreshing from heaven, okay, Peter was preaching on that day about the Holy Spirit's coming in the midst of the people in Jerusalem and then Speaking about the second coming of Jesus Christ, his return, that is the refreshing from heaven he's talking about. Acts, they explain that all through that wonderful book of 28 chapters. And Jesus will remain in heaven until he comes again. Please understand that as far as the word he used quite often, Nabi, listen carefully please. Nabi, in the Arabic language, means a person who predicts the future. Naba, which is similar to Hebrew, means a spring that bubbles over with the message of God. If you are a preacher, if you are a minister, you could be called by that title because you are bubbling with the message of God's word. As far as we know, Muhammad was never a prophet in the sense of the scriptural prophets because he never predicted anything or prophesied anything. We will deal with that in due season in greater extent. I also like to challenge my good friend here. How in the world does a man who is working on a master's degree jump up to judge a book written 2,000 years before he was born by eyewitnesses, mind you, eyewitnesses, and then say, this was not here, and this was not there, and that was not there? Huh? The scripture, ladies and gentlemen, was written by eyewitnesses. Matthew was there. He wrote in his lifetime, not after he died. Nobody interpolated. Nobody put the scripture or that scripture. And as far as the portions of John, I'd like to inform you, if you're not familiar with your Bible, Jesus was speaking to the disciples, and when he finished that discourse, he simply prayed what we call the high priestly prayer. I have been to Jerusalem, and I've been there, I live there, I went to all the places, I've taken 39 tours with people, for friends of mine, and you can walk from the Mount of Zion all the way down to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he spent the last night in prayer, and recognize that it is very easy to have said these, sir, from the walk, from up the mountain till you get to the garden. There was nothing put in there later. John outlived everybody. And as a result, he had the faculty, the memory, the Holy Spirit upon his life to write also 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, the book of Revelation. As a man of God, 
as a prophet of God, as an apostle of God, he wrote all these details and he ended by saying that I have written this because as an eyewitness, I have written this that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing in him, you have eternal life. Why would he deceive you? Why would he add something that is not there? Why would he say something that Jesus did not say? He would be lying. And the word of God concludes by the fact that if anybody adds or takes away from the Bible, God will put a curse on him. You must remember that, please. And now, I come to another interesting point here. Five minutes. Thank you. Anyway, it's on the back of this. <laughs> I believe our desire is very simple. We want to know the truth. This is called Quran al Karim. Lately, they've been calling it the Holy Quran. It has never been used by that name. Why is that Holy Quran? This is the Bible. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I simply want to ask you a question. Just a simple question. Maybe even a childish question. You don't believe God will deceive you and me, would you? God is a God of order, God of peace. Is it possible for you to accept that these two books claim to be inspired by God Yet they contradict each other. I conclude my presentation. Thank you. So if I could uh, ask that uh, we have a four minute conclusion uh, from uh, both speakers and if we f start with uh, uh, Shabir Ali to finish uh, to do his conclusion for tonight. Folks, the first point I want to refer back to is Dr. Shirosh's uh, quotation from the Quran uh, showing that the prophethood will be from among the Israelites. Now, on a point of logic, if I say that something will come from there, it doesn't mean that it can come only from there. There's a difference between saying this and saying only this. The Quran does not say only from among the Israelites will the prophethood be given, and therefore there is an allowance for the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to also be a messenger of God. And by the way, his being a messenger of God includes his being a prophet because by definition, every prophet is a messenger, though not every messenger is a prophet. A messenger is a prophet with a distinction. So saying Muhammad is the messenger of God in our shahada includes his being a prophet. Dr. Shura spent a lot of time again saying that the Holy Spirit is God and therefore not Muhammad. Folks, you'll recall from the start that that was never my point. I never claimed that Muhammad is the Holy Spirit. I said that uh, the Holy Spirit in chapter 14 of John's Gospel is uh, a later rendition of the saying of Jesus than the original saying pointed towards the paraclete who is a prophet, who is obviously the prophet Muhammad, as described in John chapter 16, where the male pronoun is used, obviously a male salvific figure, as many Christian scholars whom I have cited have maintained, like Rudolf Bultmann, Hermann Sasse, and uh, Windisch. Uh, now, uh, he thinks that there is a confusion in the Quran because of the different ways in which the Holy Spirit is treated in, in the Quran. But that's only because the term itself is mysterious, the same kind of uh, different uh, a way of dealing with it is seen in the Bible. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it either says a wind came up from God and was hovering over the waters, or the Spirit of God. What does it mean? Check your commentaries. You will see that biblical scholars cannot decide, not because there is a confusion here, but because we're dealing with something that is ineffable. It is mysterious. Uh, Surah 61, verse number 6, referring to Ahmad, has not been said to be an interpolation by any a reputable scholar that I'm aware of. Not even in the Atlantic Monthly uh, magazine, in the article that I have read, 
and post it on Dr. Shirosh's website. It doesn't say anything like that. Dr. Shirosh, where do you get this from? The Yemenite scrolls were, were discovered, and yes, this is exciting. Exciting for Muslims as well, because John Wansbrough and others, and even my good friend Jay Smith, with whom I debated sometimes, uh, used to say that there are no early manuscripts of the Quran from the first century, and now manuscripts have been discovered. They were saying the Quran was invented later, and now these manuscripts show that the Quran was around even in the first century. Yes, it is exciting. Dr. Dr. Shiroz insists that, that on this, reading the Song of Solomon, we should take it as a, a sexual um, a love poem. But in fact, uh, Dr. Shiroz, you should read that psalm and see if you really want to take it like that and consider it to be the word of God, except, especially chapter 7 and read the commentaries and understand the euphemisms which are being used. No, the Jewish scholars were correct in saying that this is the word of God. It is not uh, like, it mean, it, like it shows. It is, um, it, it is a depiction of love between God and his people. And in that case, the Christian scholars said it is between Christ and his church. And naturally, Muslim can say it is between Muhammad and his uh, followers, especially since there is an echo of his name as we read the Hebrew of that psalm. I didn't say that the psalm gives us his name, but an echo of his name when we read the Hebrew, and that definitely is there. Finally, folks, I can put before you that uh, the five points I presented do hold up. Uh, there, none of these five points have been um, uh, taken down by Dr. Shirosh, even though he has tried very much. His reference, for example, to the Psalm of David and ask uh, why uh, Psalm of David referring to Jesus. Well, uh, of course, it refers to David in the original. And why would uh, somebody working on a master's degree consider these Gospels to not be written by the authors whose name they bear? Because uh, PhD scholars who are teaching me have told me exactly this and have written it in the books and I've cited some of these writers. Thank you very much. If I could ask uh, Dr. Shros to uh, conclude with a four-minute uh, conclusion, please. I will disregard and all these conjectures of my good friend and statements because he has forgotten we have 2,000 years of theology History, missions, evangelism that goes counter to every point he has made. For indeed, we believe Jesus and Jesus alone is the prophet that Moses talked about. And Jesus, Jesus alone is the one who sent the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself had just miraculously fed 5,000 people from five loaves and two fish. The excited crowd proclaimed, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. John 6, 14. Many Jews in those days were wondering if Jesus of Nazareth was the fulfillment of Genesis 49, 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Moses, the great lawgiver, had come centuries earlier and was a descendant of the Levites. But the peacemaker, Shiloh by name, which Jacob predicted would come from the tribe of Judah, Apparently, some of the Jews believed that Jesus was the one because he was from the tribe of Judah. John 15, 6 tells us that after the miracles of the fish and the bread, they wanted to come and take him by force to make him king. As for a previous point he made, that Jesus could not be the one because from Galilee, because no prophets came from Galilee. I've got news for you. Apparently, he does not know that Nahum, we have a town named after him in Galilee, came from there. Jonah, the book of Jonah, came from there, near my hometown of Nazareth. So we have Galileans that came from there. All right? Again, while Jesus was preaching in Jerusalem, the populace responded to him in this remarkable fashion. Truly, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. John 7, 40 and 41. Many of the Jews did not distinguish between the coming prophet and the coming Messiah. To them, he was one and the same. And indeed, Jesus was both the prophet and the Messiah. Dear friends, let us simplify the entire discussion of this engaging topic. If you are drowning in a lake, do you need a prophet or a philosopher to predict your dire consequences or a compassionate person who would risk his life in order to save you? 
Jesus announced, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. If you are tired and bent under a heavy load of worry and sin, do you need a psychologist to identify your problems or someone to remove your burdens? Jesus proclaimed, come to me, all you labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. If you are Jewish and recite Psalm 23, 1, which says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jesus invites you to know who is this shepherd. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. If you are a Muslim who prays every day, show us the straight path. Surah 1, 5, Jesus invites you to experience the answer to this prayer in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you claim to be a Christian, yet not sure of your salvation and eternal destination, Jesus invites you to believe his assurance. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're a Hindu, agnostic, atheist, whatever you are, or per whatever persuasion, Christ invites you to, you to find out the greatest truth. For God, soul of the world, that he sacrificed his one and only son, that anyone believing in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his, his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3, 16 to 17. Thank you and the Lord bless you. Okay, uh, thank you very much to both speakers for um, their uh, prolific uh, discussions and also uh, for keeping to time as well. Um, uh, we still did very well, uh, very difficult in the circumstance. We have a round um, and uh, hopefully we'll try and get through uh, the piles by, by tonight. If your question wasn't asked, and I can only apologize, I'm sure there'll be some other way to get in contact with the speakers uh, after the speeches, uh, but don't forget there is another three nights of questioning. Uh, the first uh, question, um, is uh, to, to Shabir to um, um, apologies if this doesn't make entire sense if uh, they interpret songs uh, on songs as Muslims uh, to prove Muhammad as a prophet uh, said by Moses uh, then can they accept if Ahmadiyya would interpret this particular verse for them and provide Mirza Qadian as a prophet would you accept this A bit disjointed, but <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I have three minutes, yes? You have three minutes to answer that. Um, now, according to our agreement, folks, uh, in our three minutes or whatever time is allotted, we can, in fact, deal with some uh, earlier points if necessary. And I'd like to pick up on a point that Dr. Shirosh has raised about the prophet being from Galilee. I did not say that the prophet, uh, I did not say a prophet cannot be from Galilee, which is the point he was answering. I said the prophet cannot be from Galilee, and there's a difference. And there are two readings in that verse in John's Gospel, if you check it, uh, and you will see that Dr. Raymond Brown, in fact, has dealt with this, and he quoted the very verses that Dr. Shirosh quoted and showed that uh, the proper reading is that they were saying that the prophet cannot come from Galilee, because everybody knew, as Dr. Shirosh knew and said, that, uh, in fact, prophets did come from Galilee previously. But that prophet, like Moses, who was to come, cannot be from Galilee, and that was my point, it still holds. Now, as for the question, uh, no, I do not believe that, that uh, it is a proper reading to say that that passage in the Quran can refer to Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian, because as much as I've studied the life and teachings of that uh, individual, I found that his teachings are in fact, um, in a way, self-contradictory. And I say this with great respect to anyone who is here and is a follower uh, of his teachings. But uh, that is my, uh, uh, my view after a careful study of his life and teachings. Because he places himself as a follower of the Prophet Muhammad. And it is very clear that Muhammad is the seal of all of the prophets, as is said in the Quran in Surah 33, verse number 40. And it's said in many of the sayings which are authentically attributed to him, he is the Khatamun Nabiyyin, La Nabi Abadi, he says. He says, I'm Aqib, the last one, and so on. All of these point to the fact that he is the last prophet. Now, if someone else claims to be another prophet and still claims to be a follower of this man, it seems that the claim of the latter is self contradictory, and for that reason, it cannot uh, therefore be true. Now, Dr. Shirosh about this verse has said that uh, the, the name Ahmed was not applied to the Prophet Muhammad uh, for another hundred years or so. And in fact, he's on good grounds here because uh, uh, Dr. William Montgomery Watt has demonstrated the same in his, uh, in his book, um, uh, Collected Papers on er Early Islam. 
Uh, it's possible, however, that the term ism here, meaning name, could mean a description, and it's used in the Quran like that, uh, that you do not know anyone who has similar name like him, meaning a similar description like God, or that John the Baptist, uh, there was no one named uh, that previously. It could be that no one with his description as is possible in the Arabic language. It is then feasible that in that Quranic passage, what is being said is that Jesus spoke about the one to come after him whose description will be the praised one. And in fact, when we look at that and we tie that in with the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, which says he's altogether lovely or altogether desirable, which is a better translation given by Templar Longman III, uh, we find then that uh, it fits in because Muhammad, peace be upon him, is praiseworthy. He is altogether desirable. When you look at him, you admire his teachings, the words which are coming from his mouth, which are altogether sweet, uh, they are in fact a fulfillment of that. A uh, question for Dr. Shirosh. Uh, Dr. Anish Shirosh claimed that the Prophet Muhammad translated Hebrew to Arabic. Uh, the scientific explanation, uh, the question is, the scientific explanation of how an embryo is formed, the shape of the earth, other prophecy, prophecies that have come to pass, why aren't they in the Bible or the Torah? First of all, I'd like to thank you, sir, and mention to you, my dear friend, that Dr. Montgomery is the same man who said that Ahmed was not used in the Arab world till 150 years after Muhammad had died. I just same man that. you're saying. I just so, with you on that. second thing is that the good example Muhammad set for us, the Quran I have in Arabic, Urdu and English, says he said he led 66 battles. What a good example is that? And the Quran has over 100 verses about killing others to provide them with the opportunity to be Muslims. If they don't become Muslims, they're out, gone. What do you do with all that? What's so sweet about that? And what about the, the many wives? We leave that alone. But now, I'd like to address my friends here with the fact that uh, what uh, they are talking about is borrowed from the Bible. See, practically 75% of the Quran, I have no, never backed from that, is borrowed from the, from the scripture. And the Psalms here, 139, tells you, here it is, how this formation is. My frame was not hidden, 139, verse 15, from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrote in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. This is where the Quran borrowed the idea of embryology. And in your book, they all were written the days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. As for the, uh, the other matter of scientific things, I'd like to tell you we'll be dealing with that more uh, so in the days to come, but this is where the interesting scripture is concerning the matter of this earth we're living on and the balances of it. It says in chapter 40 of Isaiah, verse 22, before Christopher Columbus came around, Amerigo Vespucci discovered America and all the rest of them. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spread them out like a tent to dwell in. Thank you. Uh, the uh, the uh, second question for uh, Brother Shabir is: um, uh, Paraclete uh, was uh, to uh, was was to bring glory to Jesus Christ, and yet uh, Muhammad glorified Allah in uh, sixteen thirteen to fifteen. Taking the idea of Muhammad as um, Paraclete to its actual conclusion. Uh, would you say that Jesus Christ um, is Allah, uh, the God of Muhammad? <laughs> There's some complaints, I can't hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, allow me to just reset my watch for a minute. Sorry. Yes. Here it goes. Hmm. Now, first, uh, about the many wives. I thought that was a sweet part, Dr. Shirosh. Are you, <laughs> are you jealous or what? I think so. <laughs> 
Now, in fact, uh, historians of the life of, of Muhammad agree that uh, many of his marriages were for political and social reasons. In fact, they think all of his marriages, such as John Esposito, Karen Armstrong, and others who have reviewed his uh, life. And uh, we do not have the time to go into each and every one of them, but we can see uh, that they, in fact, fulfill that description. Now, as to his battles, uh, the historians, the early historians of the Prophet Muhammad were very interested in recording battles, so they wrote book Kitab al-Maghazi. But in fact, uh, later historians examining these would find that many of what were called battles were not battles, were more like saraya or uh, campaigns. Sometimes uh, spying expeditions were classified as, a, as one of the battles, and that would give, up the, the, but that would give the number which uh, Dr. Shirosh has quoted, but then that would be an inflated number, it's not actual fact. Uh, second, uh, what about the verses which uh, Dr. Shirosh thinks to be verses enjoining killing non-believers? In fact, when these verses are understood in their context, you will see that the Quran is not a disjointed book, but is a collection of uh, inspired speeches given over 23 years in a variety of circumstances. Some of the circumstances were such that the Muslims were being attacked by enemy forces, and so the Quran naturally told them to rise in defense, and even in the battlefield to kill the enemy if they had to. But that belongs to the battlefield. It does not mean that we bring the battlefield uh, to our airports and to our airplanes, of some, as some have done, uh, maligning the name of Islam from within. And moreover, is the Quran borrowed from the Bible? As I've said before, the Quran improves upon the stories in the Bible, and I would beg Dr. Shirosh to give an example of where the Quran does not actually do that, and I'll give you several examples of where the Quran actually does that, even the example that he will present. Isaiah is speaking about the circle of the earth. Well, folks, the circle is flat, and I've yet to see someone who actually has given, written a book about the science uh, corresponding with, uh, with statements in the Bible, whereas, in fact, we do see that uh, people have written books about the correspondence between science and Islam. Uh, finally, uh, to the question, uh, yes, uh, the, uh, the passage speaks about the paraclete vindicating Jesus, and that is what Muhammad actually did by showing that Jesus did not actually die the death of an accursed person, because ma kataluhu ma salabuhu walakin shubbe halahum. Moreover, the Quran defends Jesus' mother by saying that what they have uttered against her is bohtan and azima. They had said that she gave birth to her by illegitimate means. The Quran defends her and uh, defends uh, her son. And in that case, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, fulfills that description of the paraclete who was to vindicate Jesus. And we do not see that the Holy Spirit has actually done that. Thank you. A question to Dr. Shirosh. Um, could you please tell us then who is Muhammad and what is the Quran? and where it came from, based on the fact that many Arabs try to construct something similar, and uh, nobody has been able to do that so far. Here it is. It has been done. The true for Khan. You can have a copy, there are a few of them outside. And the answer of 1400 years to the challenge is not only in Arabic, the language of Allah, but the language of the world, English. It's Arabic and in English. We'll deal with that later. As for the crucifixion, appreciate what he was saying, but it's not the truth. Because the truth is the Quran and Muhammad denied the most important thing for which Jesus came. The crucifixion for your sins and mine. Because the scripture is replete. 300 prophecies over the period of 1500 years talking about the coming of this special person, the Messiah of God, anointed to be your savior and mine. God is not interested in Islam. He's not interested in Christianity. He's not interested in Hinduism. He's not interested in religion. He has never been interested in religion. He's interested in a relationship between you and God. And can you call him Heavenly Father? You cannot until you are born again and find out through Jesus Christ your sins can be forgiven and you are not wondering, living on your nerves, whether Allah is going to send you heaven or hell because he has the authority, but you can accept his covenant that through his precious blood your sins can be forgiven. You can have a home in heaven. Nobody can give that assurance except Jesus Christ. Now as far as the other battles, I want to ask you, who fought the first battle? The battle of Badr. Huh? Who attacked him? Who attacked him from Spain? Who attacked him from France? Who attacked him from Persia? Nobody. 66 battles, defensive battles, my goodness, let's be serious. We're talking about the truth. Study the truth, the word of God. Truth is Jesus' embodiment of truth. That's why he could say, 
truly, truly, I say unto you. He never sinned. He is a sinless one. Three times Allah tells Muhammad to ask forgiveness of his sins. The word of God is the embodiment of truth. And he is the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case saying to you, Jesus loves you. Muhammad didn't die for your sins. Jesus did. Muhammad is in his grave. Jesus is alive. Muhammad is not coming back. Jesus is coming back. Why? You can answer that question. Thank you. A question for Shabir Ali. Uh, surely the proof of the prophethood of Muhammad uh, lies in proving the miraculous nature of the Quran, which is a rational proof, and not in the refutation of a corrupted text. Aren't you digging a hole for yourself by referring to the Old and New Testament? Well, yes, the proof of Muhammad lies separately and outside of the Bible for Muslims. At the same time, when we um, deal with uh, others who have a certain proof, uh, we can examine their proof and see if, in fact, that proof actually leads to our proof. And this is what we have actually done tonight. No, I have not dug a hole for myself because I've used the Bible in a scholarly manner, in a way showing the history and the development of the scripture over time, trying to retrace the steps and find out what was original, what was more accurate, and seeing in that a reflection of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, having answered uh, that, I can now answer uh, Dr. Shirosh's question. Why did uh, Muhammad not die for the sins of people? Folks, you do not need someone to die for your sins. You need to reach out to God. This is what I meant when I said we do not need a mediator. Yes, Dr. Shirosh is right. You can pray to God and he can forgive your sins. But that's different from having someone mediate between you and God and making God change his mind uh, for you. Uh, no, you can make God change his mind, not by forcing God, not by having a mediator imposed between you and God, but by just simply asking God, please forgive me, I'm a human being, I've sinned, and I try to do my best, and God will forgive you, we believe. Now, Dr. Shirosh apparently has not heard me, and this is unfortunate, because he has to deal with my specific points. He cannot just simply repeat again 66 battles when I've already classified them as being some battles and some um, uh, saraya. He has to deal with that. Otherwise, we'll be like two ships passing in the night and not uh, interacting with each other. The Battle of Badr was also, in a sense, a defensive battle, no matter how you understand it, and there are different ways of reconstructing the history behind that. The Quran itself uh, puts it by saying, well, uh, Permission is given to those who have been attacked because uh, they have been oppressed. And that is the verse from Surah 22, verse number 39, which expressed permission for Muslims to go forth and defend themselves because they were being attacked. It looks like the Battle of Badr is included in that. Now, now, what about the true Furqan? I have read some parts of it and I'm not satisfied. The Quran says, uh, uh, bring something like it and call your witnesses besides Allah if you are truthful. So get the experts in the language to review that book and show us that in fact this book matches the beauty, the eloquence, the wisdom of the Quran. And now 1400 years have passed. A lot of water has flown under the, uh, flowed under the bridge. Now the, Mu the Muslim community has uh, received the Quran as a living experience. Can the true Furqan supplant that and show itself to be a better book than the Quran itself? I do not believe so. Moreover, some of the doctrines of the true Furqan I have found to be self-contradictory and that the Quran does not have any self-contradictory doctrines. When the Quran teaches the unity of God, the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, all of this is quite clear, simple, non-contradictory, not true with the book which Dr. Shirosh has shown us as the true Furqan. And finally, the crucifixion was not the main thing about Jesus. Jesus taught many people and gained many followers. He should be known for the truth of his teachings, his honesty, his good morals. Uh, not his crucifixion. Crucifixion, his death on the cross as an accursed sinner, uh, that is not what Jesus was about. Thank you. Uh, we'll have to make this the last question for tonight, um, as time has uh, caught up with us. And it's, of course, to Dr. Shirosh. Uh, the question is, Dr. Shirosh says that Muhammad was a very educated man. Even if this was true, how can he claim that the Quran was written by Muhammad? If it was written by a man, how come nobody, past or present, uh, could or could not produce anything that's been asked for? Beautiful, the Quran. The Quran is unmatched in the literacy, superiority, and rhythmic beauty. Um, that's the last question for tonight. I need to uh, share with you something very special about the situation at hand. 
I really believe Muhammad started in a magnificent way. In the first 12 years of his life, he was an exemplary fellow. He was even called a Lameen. Unfortunately, because he made a mistake of declaring Allat, Uzzamanat, where goddesses and their intercession is accepted, and the Meccans bowed down, and then he changed his mind and said these were a setting verses. They plotted to kill him. He had Ali sleep in his bed, and he fled. Hijra is actually an escape. The beginning of Islam, strange enough, begins at that moment. Not the birth of Muhammad, not the so-called revelations, but he escaped. And as an orphan who had nothing, he had gained great position by being the man who is among the elite of the city, by marrying this woman, Khadija, who had been already a widow twice, so he had the claim to all his, her riches. And when he left, he began to plan to come back to the town that kicked him out, and eight years later, he came with 10,000 followers. And after Khalil ibn Walid took a fight and lost 44 people, 45 people, then he took over the city and made them follow this religion. And I believe as a Christian Arab, without the sword of Islam, you would have never heard of Muhammad or his name or his religion. He would have been buried in the sand dunes of Arabia. The truth is, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, not Muhammad. He does not save you. Jesus saves you. As for the cross and crucifixion, we'll talk about that Sunday, Lord willing, and we'll explain to you in detail how there is no way anybody with a sense in his head would believe a handful of verses of a book written 600 years after the fact would be accepted when the eyewitnesses have written a fourth of all the Gospels in details about the people, their person, their time, the governors, and everybody else who watched and experienced the fantastic truth that Jesus died for sinners. And he prayed for you when he said on the cross, Father, forgive them. May he forgive us for the misunderstanding we have and come to know that to know God is the beginning of wisdom. Thank you and God bless you. Um, I'd like to just take this uh, last opportunity to thank uh, both the speakers tonight for uh, uh, their uh, wonderful uh, uh, discourses on the topic on, sorry, Muhammad in uh, the Bible. So if you could give a, good hand, a big hand, please, to both speakers. Just, uh, just before you do head off, just to men make mention to a couple of things. Uh, one is, oh, sorry, yes, of course. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very uh, to much. To make mention of uh, the, the sponsors for tonight, uh, this uh, event is organized by the Muslim Information Service Scotland. And thanks to uh, Halal Mortgages, JBNS, Mango PR, and Islamic Finance Council of Scotland. Um, just to mention tomorrow as well, uh, just before you do head off, just give me two minutes please, uh, to mention that tomorrow's lecture will be a uh, debate Allah or Trinity, the nature and character of Allah and Trinity, idolatry, paganism, or true monotheism, showing God's love. Uh, Sunday, crucifixion, uh, or uh, crucifixion, or, or, or fact or not, crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, historical fact or error. And finally, on Monday, debate for Bible versus Quran. There have been a lot of questions about that, and I hope you can come on each evening to that. Um, I would like to thank the audience tonight for uh, staying within the rules of the, 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 the debate and discussion. I heard very few um, amens or um, uh, Allahu Akbar. Thank you very much for sticking to that. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, you'll come back tomorrow and take part in the debates. Uh, there is uh, some literature and uh, leaflets at the back, which you're more than welcome to take before you leave. And uh, just to mention...